gents, just about to start kick off. Good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to turn off any electronic devices uh, that they may have on their persons. Uh, our first item of business today is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth on the implementation of the Scotland Act 2012. Mr Swinney is accompanied today by Alistair Brown and Alison Cumming of the Scottish Government. Um, both the Scottish and UK governments are required to bring forward reports under Section 33 of the Act and members of copies of both reports. The committee will take evidence of the UK government's report in the coming weeks. I would like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short introductory statement. Thank you, Convener. This is the second annual report and the last report before the devolved tax and borrowing provisions in the Scotland Act 2012 are implemented in April 2015. Our report describes the progress that continues to be made by the Scottish Government on the arrangements for implementing these provisions. Significant work has taken place over the last year in line with the programme plans. The legislation for land and buildings, transaction tax and Scottish landfill tax have completed their parliamentary stages and have received royal assent. As already advised to the committee, I will announce rates and bans for the devolved taxes this autumn when I present the 2015-16 draft budget to Parliament. This is also in line with agreed changes to the written agreement on the budget process. There continues to be good cooperation between HMRC and the Scottish Government as the implementation project proceeds on the Scottish rate of income tax. The Scottish Government is represented on the relevant boards with access to all project papers and background information. Significant achievements over the last year have included deciding how Scottish taxpayers will be advised of how much um, Scottish rate of income tax they have paid. Scottish taxpayers will find this information on the annual P60. They will also have access online to the HMRC tax calculator and to individual tax statements. HMRC has consulted the Scottish Government on Scottish rate options and decisions that have a potential impact on Scottish taxpayers and employers. Agreement has been reached on how to ensure that the appropriate level of tax relief is applied to contributions paid for after-tax income by Scottish taxpayers to private pensions. HMRC has been undertaking consultation work with the pensions industry in developing and communicating a solution. The Public Audit Committee has done helpful work on audit arrangements for SRIT, culminating in their report on the issue on the 10th of March. Um, the Government will respond shortly to that report. Um, audit Scotland's engagement with the task of settling the audit framework is also important, uh, as also will be their scrutiny of the process once established. A significant development has been the preparation by HMRC of revised cost estimates for implementing SRIT. As the annual report says, estimated costs are now 35 to 40 million compared to 40 to 45 million in HMRC's original estimate published in November 2010. Our aim continues to be to ensure that value for money is delivered in this project. Um, in my letter to the committee on the 7th of January, I set out in detail how the block grant adjustment and reconciliation process in respect of the Scottish uh, rate is expected to work. Uh, while some details remain to be settled, there is now a well-developed understanding of the processes. Uh, we need to agree soon the block grant adjustment mechanism for the devolved taxes, uh, not least to ensure that estimates can be factored into the preparation of the draft Scottish budget this autumn. The UK Government's report describes their proposals, as our report makes clear, those proposals move away from those set out in the command paper of November 2010, and I am currently in discussions with the UK Government on this matter. Um, my task is to achieve an outcome from these discussions that the Finance Committee and the, indeed the Parliament uh, can agree is fair for Scotland. Um, Parliament has a key role in continuing to provide assurance and uh, scrutiny in this process, and I look forward to discussing these important issues with the committee. Um, Thank you very much for that opening we statement. We also have just there is also material on the Fiscal Commission, which I assume we're coming to as a, as a further item. Yes, that's a separate item on the agenda, so we won't be asking you about that at this point, to Cabinet Secretary. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, first of all, about the block grant adjustment, uh, um, um, looking at your uh, second annual report. I have to say, interestingly, I think the photograph of you in this report was taken when I was at school, Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not sure what to read into that remark, convener, but I shall think about it and worry about it for the whole remainder of this session, I think. OK, let's get to the meat of it then. I mean, you talked about agreement with the UK government being reached uh, soon uh, in your opening statement. Um, 
And uh, you say in paragraph 42 of the report that the block grant adjustment in respect of the devolved taxes remains under discussion between ministers. Uh, I wonder, though, if you can tell us what the bottlenecks actually are at this stage to um, full resolution of this issue. Essentially, what um, we, we've been essentially in two phases of a discussion here, convener. The first has been um, the examination of what was in the command paper, which was considered by Parliament and was the basis upon which Parliament uh, gave us consent to the proposals in the Scotland Act. And in the command paper, um, the United Kingdom government said when the smaller taxes are devolved, there will be a one-off reduction which will then be deducted from the block grant for all future years. Um, and that was the, the, the reference in the command paper. Now, what the UK government has um, made clear is that I suppose what they what they're now saying they really envisaged with those words was there would be a one-off adjustment and then an indexation to ensure that the um, uh, Scottish uh, public purse uh, did not benefit disproportionately from the devolution of this tax. Now, you know, I, I've obviously, as you will imagine, contended very strongly that that was not what was in the command paper, and that has been my position um, in the early part of the discussions with the, the UK government. The UK government has advanced to us um, a proposal which um, also features in their proposals to, uh, to the National Assembly for Wales on the Wales command paper that's uh, recently been published, which involves um, what would be called a, a form of Barnet uh, abatement. And uh, that would involve a form of indexation of a one-off adjustment of the um, the block grant, which would involve um, influencing the Barnett formula. Um, I've indicated to the UK government that, that is um, uh, not acceptable to us, and I have submitted to them alternative proposals in an attempt to resolve the, uh, the uh, difference of opinion that we have on this question. I mean... Uh... You know, the um, Secretary to, to Treasury, Danny Alexander, MP, has made it clear he doesn't want the UK to be disadvantaged by this process. Quite clearly, the Scottish Government doesn't want to be disadvantaged either. But what is the potential disadvantage if the, um, financially if the UK gets its way? What would be the, the implications to the, the Scottish budget? Well, I think the, the, what's... It's difficult for me to put to, to quantify any proposals because I haven't seen a you know I've not seen from the UK government a proposition that would enable me to definitively answer that question because it depends on the comparison between well it depends on two things uh, the size of the block grant adjustment uh, as a one-off uh, which there will be under any circumstance under any proposal there will be a one-off block grant adjustment um, but then the indexation uh, mechanism obviously relates to the potential growth in public expenditure within the United Kingdom. And that's, you know, it's a, it's a figure that I'm uh, at the present moment unable to quantify. Um, so what I'm trying to do is to ensure that we remain um, very clearly uh, aligned to the contents of the command paper um, and also that we have the opportunity to ensure that the growth of um, tax revenue as a consequence of the devolution of these tax instruments relates to the performance of the Scottish economy and not the performance of public expenditure in the whole of the United Kingdom. Thank you. And you've said in paragraph 44, uh, we've written to HM Treasury proposing a settlement which we believe addresses the concerns of the UK government, provides an equitable settlement for Scotland, and unlike the UK government proposal, does not amend the ratios used for the Barnett formula. What are your concerns in terms of these ratios? Uh, well, I, 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 I simply don't think that the, uh, the, 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 there is a, a relevant connection between the devolution of these tax powers and the operation of the Barnett formula. Um, the, the devolution of these tax powers is to increase the accountability and the fiscal flexibility of the Scottish Parliament. I therefore think we should be um, able to establish a connection between the performance of the Scottish economy and the performance of the tax base in question 
and we should be able to retain the returns as a consequence of that connection. And there should be no relationship to public expenditure um, as a consequence of uh, no ongoing relationship to public expenditure once we've made the one-off block grant adjustment, um, which was always envisaged. OK, thank you for that. Now, turning to um, borrowing, actually, um, when you appeared before the committee in September 2013, the committee sought clarification as to where the Scottish Government and Scottish local authorities might be disadvantaged by not having access to the project rate, which is intended to take forward uh, particular major infrastructure projects. And the Cabinet Secretary of the Treasury indicated that you'd be happy to look at this point. As yet, however, no clarification has been received. I wonder if you could possibly provide some, some for the committee. Um, the, uh, I think I'd have to come back to the committee with a definitive uh, view on that um, in, a, uh, in looking at uh, all current statements and the contents of the budget document from a, earlier this year. Um, but uh, I'll give the committee a definitive uh, response in writing on that question, Camille. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, can, can you tell us how you've managed to uh, the, reduce the costs, basically how the costs have been reduced in terms of the implementation? Because it's quite a significant difference, actually, um, in terms of the reduction of the, the costs of implementation. What I think um, is the best way to explain this is that HMRC have given... Um, some outline estimates of the likely costs um, in the original proposition that was in the command paper. Um, these are by their nature um, much more general estimates of the likely costs that would be involved and would not have benefited, you know, the time when they were produced, it would not have benefited from the type of detailed scrutiny and project planning work that will now have been going on in relation to the implementation of these um, system changes and uh, IT measures. So as a consequence of that effort, uh, convener, where the um, all relevant parties and, and obviously Scottish Government officials have a very clear mandate from me in those discussions to be minimising the cost to the public purse in Scotland, given that we are meeting these costs, um, where the strongest possible scrutiny is being applied to all of these measures to ensure that they represent value for money. So. I think that the best way to explain it would be to say that um, the outline estimates of HMRC, um, which were produced some time earlier, uh, have been subjected to the rigour of project planning, and as a consequence, we have um, a more robust estimate. Of course, the, 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 the pressure and the approach that um, I've mandated my officials to take forward uh, will continue to try to ensure that we get to... Um, as strong a possible position as we can in that respect. Thank you. Now, in terms of uh, receipts for land builders transaction tax, um, we took evidence recently from the, the Office of Budget Responsibility, and uh, they have, as you probably know, since March 2013, uh, uprated their forecasts for receipts for this financial year for SDLT as it is at present, from 372 to 456 million, which is an increase of about 22 per cent. And uh, in questions, they've, um, they've said that the reason for that is because of the pick-up house prices and uh, there are more property transactions uh, taking place in Scotland. I just wonder if you um, are happy with these kind of uh, forecasts that are currently being put forward by the OBR on this particular issue. I certainly think that the, um, the factors that um, uh, they cite are factors that are borne out by evidence of a general increase in house prices and a general increase in the number of transactions. Um, whether that uh, represents um, a 22 per cent increase from the uh, values that they were setting forward um, is a different question altogether, convener. And, uh, obviously, um, part of the exercise the Scottish Government will do um, in projecting future revenues um, is that we will look at all relevant data um, in this respect and uh, put our, uh, our, our modelling and methodology to the Fiscal Commission that uh, I will establish in due course um, for them to be independently tested by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. 
Thank you for that. I'm just going to touch on one further area, Cabinet Secretary, and then I will open up the session to uh, committee members, and that's the, <clears throat> uh, the issue of the SRIT. And it's just, um, um, the, the committee has uh, previously pointed out that it's unclear how the UK will bear the risk of a deviation from the forecast receipts for SRIT during a transitional period. There will not be a, a reconciliation with actual forecasts. So, for example, if Parliament agrees to an 11 per cent rate as opposed to 10, uh, and the forecast was pessimistic. It just, it's a bit unclear as to why the Scottish budget would not be disadvantaged if the receipts for the 11% rate were not higher than forecast. Well, in, in essentially, the, uh, in, in the, 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 the risk factor, the variation factor uh, under the arrangements for the Scottish rate of income tax um, is um, carried by the Treasury in in that period of um, in the transitional period um, so essentially um, as we work through the reconciliation of all these numbers to establish um, uh, the comparison between actual receipts with projected receipts um, the Treasury will essentially um, be providing um, the but we'll be meeting the cost of any gap that will, or will arise as a consequence of there being any deviation between the projections and the amount of receipts that are generated. Um, and uh, that's been the nature of the proposal advanced by the UK government. But that reconciliation won't happen within each of the financial years. It will happen, will it, will it happen at the end of the, the three-year period. It, that, that's, that's correct, convener. But the, um, essentially, we will be working to um, ensure that we have sufficient um, comfort in the budgeting arrangements to ensure that any particular deviation is accommodated within our management of the public finances. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. There's a tsunami of members wanting to ask questions now. Uh, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, uh, can we just return to the issue of the, the block grant uh, adjustment? I thought you said something quite interesting there, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that the command paper uh, that was presented was essentially formed part of the basis on which this parliament, and presumably also the Westminster Parliament, uh, considered uh, the legislation, considered the, the Scotland. So th this is really uh, changing the, the shift in the goalpost after the event. That's, you know, may maybe Parliament might have considered matters that maybe they wouldn't have, but presumably could have considered matters somewhat differently if information had been presented differently in the command paper? I, I think you know, the command paper, in my opinion, is, 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 is absolutely crystal clear. Uh, and I think the reports of this committee, uh, of, forgive me, the, the referendum, the um, Scotland Bill Committee that considered these issues, um, was absolutely crystal clear um, that the uh, block grant adjustment mechanism was based on a one-off adjustment, and that was what any reading of the Scotland Bill Committee report is, 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 is very clear in that point. And that is why uh, such a long period has been taken in essentially uh, ex uh, pursuing that particular issue within this debate. Um, I thought it was very important that uh, Parliament's what had clearly been expressed to Parliament through the command paper and through the report of the Scotland Bill Committee um, was uh, very clearly articulated to the United Kingdom Government um, as part of these discussions. And, and returning to the issue of the OBR uh, forecast, the, the convener made an interesting point that the 22% uh, the, the increase in the, uh, their estimate in terms of uh, receipts for uh, stamp duty land tax in 2014-15 was an interesting uh, point in accepting the point you made that clearly there has been an upturn activity but surely it isn't so much the 22% increase uh, in the 2014-15 uh, estimate from uh, March 2013 to March 2014 surely it's the fact that under their estimate uh, receipts from 12-13 uh, to 14-15 would go from 20, 283 million to 456 million, which and I accept we've only calculated this in the paper here, but I, I make that out as an, a 60% increase in receipts. That, that doesn't seem credible to me. But that, that's, yeah, I think the nature of my answer to the convener that 
I think the estimates of increased activity, well, the, the in there is increased activity, there are higher property prices. Um, I think whether that translates into um, a 22% difference on estimates um, or the scale of increase that Mr Hepburn refers to between 12-13 and 14-15 um, is, uh, is a matter of significant debate. And that's, I, I, I think that's why uh, a Scottish Fiscal Commission is an important reassurance within Scotland to assess the validity of estimates that are put forward and will be the basis upon which um, we formulate estimates and we'll put them forward. And just one last question, uh, uh, convener, um, relating to the, the start-up cost for the Scottish rate of, of income tax. Clearly, it's welcome that the, the costs are uh, now, because uh, they're going to be less than the estimate in, in November 2010. But I'm just wondering, is, is there any exp explanation as to why they're quite significantly less? Is there any explanation as to, to why that might be the case? I, I, I don't think I can say more than what I said to the convener earlier on, that um, the, the, the outline estimates of 40 to 45 million um, would have been made on a more um, you know, general basis of um, project planning by HMRC and uh, obviously with the rigour that we have been applying through the project board and with the mandate that my officials have to deliver um, value for money for the Scottish public purse. Um, we have managed to get to a more refined and more reliable estimate, and, and we will continue to press on that uh, on that issue. Thank you. Okay, Michael. Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, a small uh, question, Cabinet Secretary. You mentioned your desire for a, an increase in accountability, uh, and I know there's different ways that you can hold people to account and, and judge uh, decisions that they're made. But one of them is the, the amount of tax that you're taking from them. Now, it would appear that. There has been some discussion between yourself and HMRC about whether the amount of SRIT that is taken should be on people's pay slips. Now, if people do not know how much they are being taxed, then the amount by which you can hold them accountable uh, or, or the, they can uh, hold their government to account might be seen as being diminished. So this decision, while it might be in a practical sense because of costs and and some technicalities. Who was consulted about whether we should know what the SRIT element is? Uh, were, was the business community consulted? Was uh, the trade unions consulted? Because I think it's important that we know why people won't know how much they're being taxed by the, the Scottish Government. Well, people will know, um, because the information will be set out in their P60 on an annual basis. Um, so uh, that's the, the, the judgment I took as my decision um, was that um, there would be a greater cost to employers um, if we um, required um, all periodic um, wage and salary slips to include information on how much SRIT had been paid on an ongoing basis. Um, I, I judged that people would get clarity about how much um, SRIT they were paying from their P60, um, which is an annual document available to all members of staff um, uh, or all employees. Um, and that would be uh, an appropriate way to minimise the cost to, um, to employers uh, and to ensure that members of the public were able to be clear about how much tax they were paying in this respect. So they will um, very clearly um, be able to see on their uh, annual P60 um, the amount of um, the amount of tax that's been paid in relation to the Scottish rate of income tax. In terms of consultation, um, we I, I think we discussed some of these issues with the Tax Consultation Forum. Um, which has got um, a, a, a broad membership of employers and, um, HMRC also discussed it with employers. and HMRC discussed it with employers. Okay. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, John, to be followed by Gavin. Uh, thanks, Convener. <coughs> um, I mean, one or two people have already mentioned the whole question of forecasting uh, the LBTT, or, well, SDLT, as it currently is. I mean, one of the things that concern me about... Um, OBR forecast was when it said that uh, 
they remain well below their long-run trend. So their assumption seems to be that the trend is just going to continue. Now, I thought the trend was a bit unhealthy and that people were paying well over the odds for houses, both here and elsewhere. And, I mean, that would suggest... I don't know if this is because of OBR's methodology. They have to assume these trends continue. Um, but I had hoped that, you know, some people would have learned that they were paying over the odds for houses and that actually, in the future, it, the prices would settle down at a more reasonable level. Uh, have you got thoughts on that? I, I, I think the... I think it would be um, a matter of concern if the housing market took the same course that it was taking for large parts of the period running up to 2008. Um, I think that would be undesirable because we can see what the implications of that clearly are and what it leads to within the wider decisions that people make within the economy and within their own um, economic activities and commitments. So um, I very much agree that... Um, a different approach, a more sustainable approach in the housing market would be desirable. I think the, uh, the reason why I would be very cautious about the estimates that have been put forward by the OBR is that um, I don't think these will be sufficiently refined to reflect the Scottish market. I think they will be driven largely by an extrapolation of an assessment across the whole of the United Kingdom. And the whole of the United Kingdom position will be skewed very significantly, well, enormously, by what's happening in London and the South East in relation to property prices, where from a lot of the available information, it looks as if the market is coming back to some of the conditions that were running up to 2008. So I think what's important for us is to take the responsible steps that we're taking of undertaking an assessment of these um, factors within uh, within Scotland and testing those with the Independent Fiscal Commission. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, on borrowing in a paragraph 20, it, is, it says it's the view of the Scottish Government that the option of phasing borrowing, for example, over a spending review should be open to the Government. We wrote to the UK Government on 19th February about this. Could you just explain wh what the thinking is behind this and, and this idea of phasing the borrowing? But essentially about giving us um, a bit more flexibility over the, um, the, the period of a spending review to perhaps, you know, if there is to be an annual limit put in place over a, the duration of a spending review, um, raising the question, does it have to be that we borrow that in, if we were to, to use the maximum amount of borrowing flexibility available in three equal components, or would there be an argument for um, borrowing a more significant amount at one particular period within the spending review to support the, enhance, the, the, the rollout of a particular major capital project or capital element of our capital programme. So it's simply to have that, um, uh, that flexibility that, um, uh, that would be in place. And I mean, would that necessarily mean that you would spend more in year one and less in years two and three, or would it sometimes be the other way around that you'd spend less it would in depend, one? And it would depend on the choice. Essentially, yes. it's to have the flexibility to make that choice get, to be driven by the contents of our capital programme mm -hmm. rather than an annual obligation to borrow um, the same amount of money if we were using the maximum amount of borrowing capability involved yes. in three annual instalments. Uh, there may be. You know, for very good reasons, there may be a, well, a capital pro project that we wish to undertake for which we wish to borrow, for which our, our CDL allocation is not sufficient, but we don't need any of it in year one, but we need a lot of it in year two and less of it in year three. That is the type of... Like the fourth replacement crossing, we, it, knew, we knew it was coming, so it's going to be a big bump in one or two years. Correct. Right. So just to, to have that flexibility. That's great, thanks. On the report we got from the uh, UK government, um, I was interested uh, on, in, re in regard to landfill tax, it says that uh, draft legislation setting out the necessary changes to existing legislation for the disapplication of landfill tax uh, will be published in autumn 2014. It seemed, sounded, that's obviously Westminster's timetable, it sounded quite late to me that we are introducing a new tax and they're only going to stop the old one they're only going to think about stopping the old one in the autumn? I, 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 wouldn't, I think, to be fair to the UK government, I don't think they're saying they're thinking about stopping it. It's simply well, okay. the, it's the technical... The te the, I, I, I find myself in a very unusual situation. I've been fair to the United Kingdom government, but it's in my 
it's consistent with my reputation for fairness in all these questions. Uh, these are quite simply the technical provisions to to conclude the, the these tax powers being held at Westminster. It's nothing, so we nothing, can, nothing more to be worried about than that. Right, we can be relaxed about that. Relaxed. Right? Oh, that's uh, reassuring. Thanks. And uh, I, I was interested too in some of the comments Mr. Uh, Carmichael had made in his uh, covering uh, letter. I was interested in your thoughts on that. Um, I mean, he, he talks about the two new Scottish taxes, um, land building transaction tax and the landfill tax, and um, he suggests that um, all of this is part of the United Kingdom with the strength and support of the UK's economy and resources. Uh, this is devolution in action. But I thought these two taxes were totally under our control. I, I didn't really see how uh, the UK's economy and resources were having any impact on either land and building transaction tax or a um, landfill tax. Is that your reading of it as well? That would be my reading of the situation as well, yes. Yes, OK. And um, he also talks l later on about uh, the coalition government made a commitment to the people of Scotland to deliver the recommendations of the Kalman Commission. Now, admittedly, he doesn't say all the recommendations of the Kalman Commission, but neither does he say some of the recommendations of the Kalman Commission. But I understood it included things like air passenger duty, which have not been devolved. So could you comment on this uh, statement that they are delivering the recommendations of the Kalman Commission? Well, I certainly think it's a matter of fact that the United Kingdom government is not delivering all of the recommendations of the Kalman Commission. Thank you. And uh, finally, in that bit, he says um, about the people of Scotland making a choice, should Scotland remain part of a strong, successful United Kingdom? I just wonder if it was your opinion that the United Kingdom was strong and successful. <laughs> well, um, it won't, I don't think, come as much of a surprise to, uh, to the committee that uh, I, I am a supporter of the arguments for Scottish independence. And uh, so don't, uh, um, I don't find myself in accord with uh, the Secretary of State on that point. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Gavin, to be followed by uh, Malcolm. If it's OK, I may uh, return to asking questions about the Scotland Act 2012. Um, Cabinet Secretary, very, very briefly, firstly then, the, the figure of the 35 to £40 million, pounds, is that a sort of shared estimate by the Scottish Government and the UK Government? Are you both saying you think that's, that's where it will end up? That's, emer that's emerging from the, pre the project board on which the Scottish Government is a part in which the Scottish Government is a participant. So um, we, um, we, we consider the, these, uh, that estimate to be a robust estimate. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to come on to block grant adjustment in a second, but be before I do that, there is one part in the, uh, the UK government's annual report, paragraphs 75 uh, through to 77. Uh, titled the cash reserve um, with the, the outline the mechanism of the cash reserve I just wonder if the Scottish Government has a has a position or a plan and if, if it intends to do anything with that over the, either this financial year or next financial year or if there is a, a position well, well, certainly the arrangements that are cited by the United Kingdom Government in those paragraphs are a, a, an accurate representation of the facility but the Scottish Government has um, at this stage made um, uh, no provision uh, to contribute to that cash reserve, but obviously um, there are um, budget statements yet to come. Okay, so is, is it under discussion or...? Uh... Well, so all these issues are always under discussion. Okay, all right. Um, if we come to the block grant adjustment first, deal with maybe the, the Scottish rate of income tax first. Um, is it fair to say that the, the overall mechanism then is, is broadly agreed between the Scottish Government and the UK Government? For the Scottish rate of income tax? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and one minor question. There, there is, it appears quite frequently saying that there would be two or three transitional years. I wonder if, if is it going to be two transitional years? Is it going to be three transitional years? Or is it a case of we will see how things develop and, and a decision will be taken at a later date. That's, uh, that's correct. There is, uh, you know, there, there is still um, a discussion about um, what would be the appropriate transitional period. And I think it's fair to say that nobody is um, 
nobody is absolutely certain how all of the um, reconciliation, reconciliation arrangements will, um, will, work, will work themselves out. So uh, I think there's some flexibility being retained uh, to perhaps spread that over a longer period than, um, uh, than a shorter period. Um, turning then to the block grant adjustment for the devolved taxes, um, is there likely to be an agreement that rolls the two taxes together or will the mechanism for each tax be treated separately and, and on its own merits? I, I, that would be a product of what agreement we arrive at, so I, 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 can't, uh, I can't predict where, whether that will be the case or not. Okay. I think it would be desirable if, if the two were rolled together. Okay. Um, right. the, um, you said to the convener, I think, one of the bottlenecks was indexation. Um, if you put that to one side, is, is there then broad agreement, and I suppose you're probably limited to what you can say here, but is, is there broad agreement on what the um, one-off figure would be um, if you put indexation to one side, or is there still um, some disagreement on what represents a fair one-off figure? I don't, think, I don't think you can separate agreement about the one-off adjustment from the question of indexation. If I go back to the original starting point, which I think I probably discussed with the committee when I was here a year ago in the, the, on, in the earlier report about the, um, the, the Section 33 report, um, I would have been concentrating on that provision within the command paper, which in my view is the clearest distillation of the position, which is there should be a one-off adjustment, and that is the end of the story. Um, when you then add in an issue of indexation, which has now been added in by the United Kingdom government, um, that then colours my view about, the, well, certainly it, it makes it clear to me that you cannot come to a conclusion about the one-off adjustment without coming also to a conclusion about the indexation arrangements, if you're going to have any of those in the first place. Okay, no, I understand that. Um, in terms of the um, proposal that you put to the UK government, I mean, you say in your paper, we've written to them, suggested a proposal, and they have said in their report, um, we've had a proposal, we're considering it. What, what was the approximate date of the proposal being put to the UK government? 10th of April. 10th of April. And under, maybe there's no such thing as a protocol, un under protocol, is, is there a sort of date by which you would expect an answer, of, or have you been given an indication of, of when this would be? Um, well, we've, we've not been given an indication of, um, of, of when we expect an answer. Uh, I, I certainly I'm keen to ensure this issue is resolved sooner rather than later. I think it would be better for good administration of budgeting processes if that was the case. Mm. Um, and um, I'll always be working to, uh, to affect that. And final question, I mean, the, the UK government in their report at page um, 28, um, uh, paragraph 65, they, they talk about an approach similar to when business rates were devolved to Scotland um, and then over a period of paragraphs talk about how that might operate. What, what's, what's the sort of, what would be the Scottish Government's primary objection to mirroring what happened when business rates were devolved or are, are the two, or is it so different that... Well, the, um, first, the first thing is I, I, I don't quite understand what the connection is there, to be honest, um, because when, and, and the devolution of business rates um, I think, well, well, must be 15 years ago. So we're into the realms of, you know, I wasn't intimately involved in discussions around about that, but, you know, so I, I, I don't have all of the details to hand. But um, there was, a, uh, there was a, a, a budget line within UK public expenditure on business rates. So therefore that, I can understand how when that was devolved, comparability went from 100% to zero because there was a budget line associated with the devolution of that function. There is no budget line associated with the devolution of stamp duty land tax and landfill tax. So I just, I, I just can't quite understand what 
po point is being made here about the example of business rates being somehow a touchstone for how we might go about this. I just simply cannot understand the basis of that. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm to follow by Jean. Um, I mean, in the kind of way Gavin's half um, have dealt with this, um, I think you would agree if you know if we get the result that you don't want and have further fiscal devolution, it's the income tax issue that will become crucial, uh, particularly if there's more, even more devolution of income tax. So uh, you, you said to Gavin Brown in terms of the block grant adjustment mechanism, the whole term mechanism, I suppose is what it's normally called, you said you'd agreed that with the UK government. Uh, does that mean that you're entirely happy with that or is it just something that you've agreed because that's the nature of negotiations? Um, it's certainly, um, it, it's, a, it's an infinitely preferable approach to the one that was proposed in the Calman Commission, in the command paper. And, I mean, do you happen to know, I mean, just taking the years of devolution um, uh, for the sake of argument, you know, how many years the, the um, non-savings, non-dividend tax base in Scotland has grown faster than the UK average? I don't have that to hand, but I certainly... Yeah, I think it would be quite interesting that. just for us and the public to know that. Thanks. Okay, Jean. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Cabinet Secretary, I got ticked off last week for asking too long and rambly questions, so um, I'll keep it short. <laughs> I hope there's no ticking off for people giving long, rambling answers. Uh, or we certainly will be in trouble, uh, convener. That was never discussed. Um, what is the point of the Scottish rate of income tax? Um, I think the, um, the only point of it is to give the Parliament in Scotland um, more involvement in the setting of one element of the income tax base of Scotland. But if you were to adjust it, it doesn't affect the income of Scotland, does it? I mean, that, that would that would then be compensated for in the, in the adjustment in the block grant? Um, well, right? it, it would have an effect because you potentially, if, if, the, if the Parliament decided not to collect as much tax uh, as was uh, envisaged by that block of taxation that was being devolved or decided to collect more of that tax, then obviously that would have a variation on the amount of money that the Parliament had available to deploy in public expenditure. So that would be, there would be no effect on, on the, there would be no change to the Barnett formula for, or, or to the calculation of Scotland's block grant. Um, but but it, it's more, the effect is more on the amount of money that the Parliament would have available to, to allocate to public expenditure. Okay. Thank because you. there would be a block, there would clearly be a block, a block grant adjustment, mm -hmm. but um, the decision the Parliament took on either to um, a, raise the rate of taxation or to lower it would have an effect on the amount of money we had available to spend. Yeah. And uh, my other question is uh, just about borrowing powers of the Scottish Government. <clears throat> And I will try and keep this short. One, one of the, the, the biggest concerns in local government finance is the cost of continuing PPP and PFI repayments, which um, are extraordinarily harsh and continue and are, are something about which they can't do anything. If the Scottish government is allowed to, with, with borrowing powers, would it be looking at that kind of investment that might save... Uh, money in the long run if there was a possibility of, of paying off some of the 20 and 30 year arrangements to, to pay off uh, school and other hospitals and other capital <coughs> expenditure programmes. There would have to be an, an exploration undertaken of each of the particular projects that were involved because uh, in almost all of these, well, all of these, uh, of the, the PFI commitments that were entered into, they would be entered into on a specific contractual basis for the particular asset or group of assets that were involved. And it is 
um, likely that there is probably a difference between almost every uh, proposition that is uh, every project that is in place. When I've looked previously at whether or not it was possible to renegotiate some of these uh, terms of agreements, and in almost all cases, the ability to actually renegotiate within term the contents of that agreement. Um, were so constrained that it was impossible to actually secure a better deal. In some circumstances, um, the, the contracts prevented any reopening of the contract during their 25-year life. In others, if that was to be the case, the public sector had no ability to insist upon that happening. It had to be with the consent of the um, the, the, the special purpose vehicle party and, it's in, and in many circumstances if there was to be any gain if there was to be a benefit that came out of renegotiation a significant proportion of the proceeds had to go to the special purpose vehicle in the private sector as part of the contractual arrangements that had been entered into at the outset of the PFI contracts so I I think the so the issue of re-examining PFI contracts has been very much a um, you know, priority for me. Uh, I have reluctantly come to the conclusion that the room for being able to do that is, uh, is, is limited, if non-existent. And it serves to illustrate the fact that we must take the greatest of care when we're entering into these negotiations at all times in the future. The, the, the wider question about... Um, the sustainability of borrowing, I think, is, a, is an important question, and the committee will be familiar with what I've put in place in relation to the wider fiscal framework within, within the devolved arrangements that we have, that I have set a limit on the amount of um, uh, borrowing or revenue-financed investment that we undertake of 5% of, um, of our Dell budget uh, to, to provide, essentially, a framework to discipline how many commitments we take on and what we envisage um, being utilised. And of course the same principles apply to local authorities through the exercise of their conduct uh, consistent with the Prudential Code. Thank you for that, Jean. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That's concluded questions from the from uh, colleagues around the table. I'll just get one further question, uh, Cabinet Secretary, which is um, in terms obviously marching on in terms of the the, the book, block grant adjustment. I'm just wondering if there is no agreement reached between the Scottish Government and the UK Government, will the UK Government just impose its own view on this issue? Um, I think that would be um, utterly undesirable and a dreadful mistake by the UK Government if they decided to do so. Thank you. OK, uh, colleagues, I'm not going to call a break because uh, we are only uh, 48 minutes into today's deliberations and we have the same witnesses for Agenda Item 2 as for Agenda Item 1. So our next item of business today is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's plans for a Scottish Fiscal Commission. The committee published its report on proposals for a Scottish Fiscal Commission in February and members have copies of the Scottish Government's response. Now, before moving to questions from members, I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Kavira. I'm, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to provide the Committee with further information on my proposals to establish a Scottish Fiscal Commission. Can I begin by thanking the Committee for its report of the 7th of February, which was of substantial assistance to the Government um, in drawing together the views of a range of experts and the thoughtful contribution that was made to these issues by the Finance Committee. The Scottish Fiscal Commission will be established this summer to scrutinise Scottish Government forecasts of receipts from land and buildings transaction tax and Scottish landfill tax. The Commission will also be asked to scrutinise the economic factors which underpin forecast receipts for non-domestic rates. The Commission will provide reassurance uh, over the reasonableness and integrity of our tax receipt forecasts ahead of the introduction of the 2015-16 draft Scottish Budget in the autumn and will report its findings to, public, to Parliament and the public. This will enhance the uh, strength and the credibility of the Scottish Government's tax forecasts. 
The Commission will initially be established on a non-statutory basis, but with administrative safeguards in place to protect its independence. I fully recognise the need for the Scottish Fiscal Commission to be structurally and operationally independent of the Scottish Government, and that giving the Commission a basis in statute will be important in the future. If possible, I intend to bring forward legislation to underpin the Scottish Fiscal Commission within the current parliamentary term. The role and remit of the Commission will continue to be reviewed and expanded as the fiscal powers of this Parliament are enhanced. I also intend to review the role of the Commission in relation to the Scottish rate of income tax prior to its planned introduction in April 2016. The Commission will have three part-time members, one of whom will act as Chair. Commission members will bring independent minds and strong economic and analytical skills to bear on the Scottish Government's tax forecasts. In order to protect the independence of the Commission, I will make appointments for a single term of office of between three and five years. This will allow for rotation of, for the Commission in line with good governance practice while managing the retention and transfer of skills and experience. Appointments to the Commission will not be remunerated, but the Scottish Government will meet all reasonable expenses incurred in the course of the Commission's business. In addition, we will make a modest budget available to the Commission to cover analytical and other necessary work. I very much welcome the role which the Scottish Parliament will play in approving nominations for appointment to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. I will formally notify the Committee of my nominations once candidates have agreed to be recommended to the Parliament for appointment. I believe that the scrutiny which the Committee I believe that the scrutiny which this committee will bring to the appointments process will further strengthen the credibility and the authority of the Commission. The creation of a Scottish Fiscal Commission is another important milestone in the journey to enhance Scotland's fiscal powers. I believe that the Scottish Fiscal Commission will play a key role in supporting the exercise of the tax powers devolved to this Parliament under the Scotland Act 2012. The proposed Commission is proportionate to those powers but creates a basis for the Commission to expand its functions over time alongside the expansion of the fiscal powers of the Scottish Parliament. I am pleased to announce the creation of the Fiscal Commission to Parliament this morning and have the opportunity to answer any further questions that the Committee has on these plans. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for that fairly short but uh, comprehensive and very helpful uh, opening statement. You have answered some of the questions I was going to ask you. So I'll move on to uh, one or two others. Um, in our uh, recommendations, um, we suggested that, um, as the OBR produces Scottish tax forecast twice a year, the SFC should also provide a commentary twice a year to include the views of the FA SFC and the economic determinants underpinning tax revenue forecast. But you, you have suggested in your response that scrutiny and commentary um, should be in a, I quote, frequency that best suits the Scottish budgeting cycle and supports the work of the Parliament holding uh, ministers to account on fiscal issues. So therefore you're suggesting a commentary uh, alongside the draft budget document each autumn. However, um, you know, uh, will the SFC also um, comment on UK budgets as the impact on Scotland? It, that will not be part of the remit, no. No, right. Um, why is that? I think, well, I... I, I, I the Fiscal Commission, I think, has got a particular role in its, um, in its foundation to essentially provide us with um, a critique and a validation of the estimates that we are making in relation to landfill tax and the, um, the land and buildings transaction tax. I think that's a particularly, and, and as, as the Scottish rate of income tax um, uh, develops, uh, so it will have a role in relation to questions around the estimating of the Scottish rate of income tax. Um, I, I want to ensure that the Fiscal Commission is performing a very um, focused piece of work for the, uh, to enable Parliament to be able to come to reasoned and considered judgments about all of the questions involved in the uh, the judgment that's required on these particular tax powers and I think clearly a commentary on the United Kingdom bu government budget is given by the Office for Budget Responsibility uh, and can be given by Parliament on any occasion that it, it sees uh, fit to do so. Okay. Um Thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, rates, you've said that NDRI modelling, such as assumptions about bad debts and appeals losses, are commercial assumptions based on experience and on assessments made within the Scottish Government and by local authorities, and it's less clear that the 
the SFC will have expertise in these areas. But you then go on um, further to say that the SFC should comment annually on, on NDRI forecasts at the time of the publication of the draft budget document. If, if they don't have much expertise in that, why would you be keen on them to comment on that? What, what I'm seeking to make a distinction about, Convener, is the difference between um, the factors where I think the Fiscal Commission will be able to add input, which will be around questions for example, on, 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 on buoyancy and on performance within the economy as to what that will have as a likely effect on the non-domestic rates income take. As part of the calculation of the non-domestic rates um, estimates for each year, we make an assessment about appeal losses, we make assessment about bad debt um, that's made by local authorities across the country. And those are essentially... Um, operational decisions that are arrived at to, um, to determine the effect of those factors on the overall NDRI totals. Um, I don't think they're affected by economic performance um, and I don't think that the Fiscal Commission will have the necessary capability to consider those issues. And of course some of those are commercially sensitive in terms of the negotiation around uh, appeals that are undertaken by uh, the assessors with individual interested parties. So I think the um, I, I will obviously discuss these questions with the Fiscal Commission once it's appointed, um, but that would be my judgment about the, um, the the relevant areas of involvement and expertise that they would have. Okay, thank you for that. I'm just going to ask one further question then, and colleagues from the committee uh, can come in. Um, in, in his submission uh, on the next item on our agenda, uh, Professor John Key, who is sitting right behind you, um, said in a paragraph four of that submission that, in his view, the OBR has been established too much as a body to give validation to what was formerly the forecasting operations of the UK Treasury and too little as a body exercising the functions described in its title, the promotion of budget responsibility. Uh, how would the Scottish Fiscal Commission differ in that regard? The the, the, the Fiscal Commission, um, as we envisage it so far, and as I, uh, as I think we established in the evidence that I gave to the committee, and that certainly what struck me from the committee's report on this question, was that the, uh, what was envisaged um, in the establishment of the Scottish Fiscal Commission was that focused body looking at the particular elements of um, tax collection that were emerging into our responsibilities in here in Scotland and to provide, as I described a moment ago, the necessary critique and then validation of the, um, the estimates that have been put forward. Um, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with validation of the estimates as long as the critique has been done in the first place. Um, uh, and uh, that, that's the... I think we have arrived at a position through the evidence the Finance Committee has taken and the report that the Finance Committee has produced um, to um, a very focused proposition uh, around the role of the Fiscal <coughs> Commission and uh, I'm certainly very happy to, uh, to implement on that basis. We can of course have, um, uh, as, as I've indicated here already convener, there will be a dynamism to this whole issue um, driven by the constitutional debate and um, we, of course, may well um, need to revisit some of the details um, around the role and the focus of the Commission in the light of the constitutional debate. OK, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Now, for the, so for the first time in three years in my convenership of this committee, there are no questions about... Oh, there are! My God! <laughs> Well, I did actually drop a hint that this would be my final question, and not one of you had put your names down to ask questions, so a wee bit smarter next time. Well, the last time I said there's a tsunami of questions is a hint, and that got a few, but um, um, it looks like there are some questions after all, Cabinet Secretary, so I'm afraid uh, you're not getting off as lightly as you may have suspected a minute ago. OK, so it'll be Gavin to be followed by Malcolm. Thank you, Kibbina. Um the, uh, f f just a couple of simple technical ones first. In terms of the, the legislation that, that you intend to bring forward, what, what's the kind of rough time scale for that? The, uh, the, the earliest I could see this coming forward, um, as things stand just now, would be in the final year of this parliamentary term. 
would be 50, so the sort of 15, 16 is the record. Okay. Um, in terms of the... W just to be absolutely clear about that, that would be Parliament year starting the autumn of 2015. Autumn 15, 15. yeah, sure. Um, as, yeah, as opposed to financial uh, year. Yeah. Um, thank you. In terms of the, the interim remit um, for the Fiscal Commission, that would be presumably want to have that in place by the summer. I think that was what you... What I would plan to do, um, uh, convener, uh, and obviously I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm in the hands of the committee in this respect because the committee has a, a significant role to play in this, that uh, reasonably shortly I would be expecting to share with the committee the nominees that I would intend to put forward. Um, I would appreciate it if the committee a, in reasonably short timescale could consider uh, the uh, nominees that I was uh, suggesting and thereafter make the appropriate reports the committee sees fit to Parliament um, to secure a parliamentary agreement for the uh, nominations that I will make. And obviously with that, I, I will clarify the, uh, the remit and other working arrangements of the Commission. Um, now, normally, Cabinet Secretary, I, uh, I encourage you to cut costs and uh, think carefully about expenditure, but I think I heard you right where you, you said there would be no remuneration for, for any of the um, commissioners, and then there would be, I think, a budget of about £20,000 for administration and resourcing and so on. Um, taking those two together, I mean, do, do you think that is going to be enough to make this body robust and to do the thorough job that we all need it to do? Yes. Um, the, the issue about remunerating members is connected with whether we have a statutory basis or not. And that's a, so that's a, a short-term issue for 14-15 um, uh, financial and parliamentary year. Um, if it has a, statu a statutory basis, then that position can change. Um, I'm certainly uh, with the... Uh, I will be guided by the Commission on the nature of the resource and expertise that they require to fulfil the functions uh, that they put in front of them. But that, uh, I, will have a, uh, I will have a very open discussion with the Commission about that question. Uh, I'm uh, very clear that the, um, the Commission has to be able to fulfil the role that Parliament envisages for it, and I will make sure it is properly equipped with the necessary resources to enable that to be the case. And uh, finally, Convener, um, in, in, in your response to the committee, we one of our recommendations was that the government should consider the option of inviting, them, inviting the SFC to produce official uh, macroeconomic and fiscal forecasts. Um, now, that was one that wasn't accepted by the government. But the Scottish Government said this, the Scottish Government believes that responsibility for carrying out economic and fiscal forecasts, including tax receipt forecasts, should lie with the Scottish Government and that primary accountability should be of ministers to the Parliament. J just in that statement, can, can I take from that then that the Scottish Government is planning to carry out economic forecasts and to publish them? But we, we, we undertake that type of activity on an ongoing basis. But do you, but, um, I don't, as I understand it, though, you don't publish economic Scottish. You don't publish official Scottish government economic forecasts. Well, uh, by that I would describe the. Um, you know, if you take, for example, the state of the economy report that the chief economist uh, published just um, last week, if my memory serves, or maybe the week before, <laughs> uh, that's got a forecast about the pattern and development of the Scottish economy within it. So I, I would, you know, that's what I would call a forecast. I suppose my, my question was just that the, maybe I, the way I read that it sounded to me as if you were now. Go, I mean, I know you look at various forecasts. I know you take views, and I, and I read the, the economic report. But I didn't, un, as I understand it, under, believe there were official Scottish government economic forecasts. The way I read that, just I was wondering, I think, is that what you're now going to be doing, or is it? Well, I think what, what, what the point I'm making in that response is to say that it's really in the context of the debate which the committee had which was about what should be the role of the Commission. Should the Commission essentially tell me, we think you're going to raise this amount of money from these taxes, 
and I should just then I should say, well, look, that's fine. That, that's that's their view, so we'll just put that into the budget. <coughs> or should I, my officials, produce an estimate and test it for validation with the fiscal commission? So that's where that point is trying to clarify that we see it as our responsibility as ministers to be accountable for assessing the path and the development of the Scottish economy and then where necessary to seek the, valid, the critique and the validation of the Fiscal Commission uh, about the contents of, that, uh, of, of, of those uh, estimates that we're making. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And we will be taking evidence on the 28th of May, or rather d discussing with your appointees the, the role uh, on that date. Uh, Malcolm. I've just got one question of a general nature, which follows on, I think, quite well from what Gavin Brown um, ended with there, because I think it would be true to say there's a little bit of disappointment in the committee that you haven't gone quite as far as we were suggesting, but I suspect there's even more disappointment among the um, economists because, well, Professor Kay is already being quoted, and another quote from his paper talks about the critical question, is the current level of public sector service provision sustainable at current levels of taxation? which I think also connects with the point that uh, Professor David Bell made in evidence to us. But you will also have seen the uh, very passionate article by Jeremy Peat in the Herald two days ago, who must be very disappointed because, of course, at the end he said that the body in Scotland should uh, be not just an informed commentator on government figures, but the actual provider of key forecasts. And earlier on he talked about the importance of having a body considering the long-term health of the uh, economy. Um, and so on. So I'm really just, I mean, my question is of a general nature, but I'm curious to know whether in fact your limited remit for this body is driven fundamentally by the fact that initially it will have a very uh, you know, small amount of <coughs> uh, taxation to, um, to deal with, or whether in fact, which perhaps was suggested by your previous answer, that you actually have a fundamental objection in principle to such a body having a wider role um, and clearly the future is unknown, but uh, if it's driven by the former, then I, I imagine you would be open to a wider role in the future. But again, I think in a remark a few minutes ago, you just talked about looking at the detail of this. So my sense is that perhaps you are actually quite, um, uh, I was going to say hostile, but certainly not sympathetic to the idea of a b body with wider powers, as has been proposed by... Uh, so many distinguished economists and, in fact, has, has, has been supported at least to um, a certain extent by this committee. I, I, I think the... the, the I, I, I struggle with the explanation that Mr Chisholm provides there um, with the views of the committee in its report, because my reading of the committee's report, and again, it's my reading of the committee's report, was that the committee was encouraging me to establish a body, and I got this very clear sense from the, um, the evidence that the committee led from me when I appeared before the committee, um, that was to um, undertake a proportionate task in relation to the taxes that we uh, have to deal with now, in relation to land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax. And uh, I remembered clearly um, setting out to the committee my view, which I thought was a, a, a view that, um, that, that, that was broadly agreed within the committee, that we had a fairly extensive commentary network about the economic performance and economic futures of Scotland, um, that that did not needed to be that there was no need to add to that uh, an additional fiscal commission in exploring that territory. Now, as I've said to the committee, so. The proposals that I'm bringing forward relate very directly to the particular tax powers that we have. Um, I've indicated to the committee that will enhance, be enhanced when the Scottish rate of income tax uh, uh, emerges. Um, it will also be the subject of review um, when we are clearer about what constitutional direction the country is going to take. Um, and I think all of those uh, comments are designed by me to say that I see a dynamic about this whole process. We start off with a body focusing on what we have the statutory function to do and to consider at this particular time, um, but we remain open, uh, and I remain open to considering how that can be expanded once uh, a broader range of responsibilities come to the Scottish Parliament. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, do you expect to use the experiences of the interim uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission to inform proposals to establish it on a statutory basis? Uh, <coughs> yes, um, and I would also be looking to dwell very heavily on the, um, the material that we have discussed as part of the committee's inquiry and the government's response to the committee's report in that respect uh, to ensure that we, um, we properly uh, we, we establish the commission on the, the most appropriate uh, footing to begin with. Okay, thank you very much. Well, Cabinet Secretary, that ends our deliberations um, in terms of your own evidence for today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, colleagues for their questions and, of course, yourself for the evidence you've given today. Uh, I'm now going to call uh, a recess until uh, 10.50 to enable members to get a natural break and to have a change of witnesses.
Our final business today is to take evidence on Scotland's public finances post-2014 from Professor John Kay, Professor Gavin McCrone and Professor Peter McGregor. Uh, members have copies of the written submissions provided by our witnesses, so we will go straight to questions uh, from myself to be followed by the committee. Now, last week, I have to say that this, the equivalent session took uh, some three and a quarter hours. <laughs> I have to say that uh, in our discussions <laughs> afterwards, I was uh, chastised, should we say, by one or two members of the committee for being a bit too liberal in allowing them to, uh, to uh, spend so much time on questions. I'm not very keen on holding committee members back, but I would ask everyone to have a self-denying ordinance. I myself will try and have that too, so I don't intend to uh, hog the limelight, so to speak, for too long. So. Uh, in saying that, though, uh, when I ask questions, um, I, I might ask them initially to one individual. Uh, the first question, for example, would be to Professor McCrone, but um, I'd be quite happy for um, colleagues on the, uh, on the panel to uh, also uh, give their comments if they so wish. It makes for a much more interesting discussion. So, without further ado, we shall kick off. Uh, and in the first paragraph, uh, Professor McCrone, you say, and I quote, the position I take is that Scotland could perfectly well manage as an independent country. It is even possible that it might eventually do better economically than remaining as part of the UK, but this would depend on the wisdom or otherwise of the policies adopted by government. You then go on to name a number of caveats uh, 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 with regard to that. And um, you talk about, uh, in, the, in that paragraph, the last sentence is there could be a loss of some key industries following independence. So, uh, I mean, I take your point on board that it would depend on the wisdom of otherwise the policy adopted by government, because, I mean, all, all sorts of different countries through uh, sound economic policy have been able to have very strong economies. I mean, Switzerland's economy uh, is bigger than Ukraine's, uh, which is seven times the population. Uh, Singapore's has got uh, per capita 15 times the GDP of um, uh, neighbouring Indonesia. Uh, so, obviously, the policies adopted by governments are are key, but in terms of the Scottish context, I wonder if you can elaborate on uh, what you've said there and also touch on the issue of the loss of some key industries such as? Well, um, I take the view that um, Scotland could perfectly well function as an independent country. I mean, it, there's no reason why it shouldn't do at least as well as Ireland, which was much, much poorer when it became independent. But you can't in my opinion, come out of a union that's lasted for 300 years without all sorts of implications from that and, and some potential damage. Um, and I think the, the two industries I would be most worried about, actually, are um, finance, where a number of the institutions are wondering whether they should stay in Scotland or go south, and the defence industries. I haven't dealt with defence either in my book or in the paper. It's a difficult subject. But plainly, some of the major defence orders might be at risk because governments on the whole tend to place their defence orders within their own countries. So those are the two areas I'd be most worried about, I think. An awful lot depends on how it happens. Um, if there's sweetness and light all round, then the damage can be minimised. If, on the other hand, the breakup was acrimonious, then things like the tourist industry could also be affected. Okay, um, uh, Professor Kay, Professor McGregor, have you anything you wish to add to that? Or, uh, I I'd, I'd just on? say, uh, I don't think I have anything add to, to add to the defence issues. On financial services, my experience is you talk to people in the industry and they express unease. It's very hard to work out what the unease is actually about when you press them. Now, that may mean it doesn't matter. The, the way in which it does matter a bit is in relation to the customers of these, uh, of these businesses. I mean, having said what I've just said in print a couple of weeks ago, I now have an email box full of people saying, I have a, from England, I have a policy with standard life, and I would be very worried if Scotland became independent. What they would be worried about, I have no idea, and nor do they really. But the fact that they would be worried is genuinely a problem for standard life, whether or not either standard life or they themselves have any basis for the worries. Professor McGregor, have you any comment? Well, I, I don't think I would add uh, anything to that. I, I, clearly, the point about the 
importance of the policies pursued by the Scottish Government post-independence is, is crucial and, uh, and that will determine the success or otherwise of independence in the, in the longer term. I agree that in the short term there are likely to be costs associated with uh, independence. Okay. Just to follow on, uh, Professor Macron, from your comments there, uh, I mean, one of the points the Scottish Government point out is that Scotland, although it contributes 9.9% of taxes to the UK, only about 5.6% of defence expenditure is actually in Scotland, and uh, they would be looking to, for a policy of joint procurement, whereby Scotland would buy equipment from south of the border and they would buy equipment from here, and would, that would be in balance. But because of our reduced... Um, the reduced budget on defence, um, 2.5 billion is being suggested, then that would free up resources to spend on other areas of Scottish life, such as, for example, schools, roads, hospitals, whatever it happens to be. What would be your, your comment on, on that? Well, um, that, that's fine, but uh, joint procurement is something, of course, that would have to be negotiated. And uh, I'm just not sure how those nego negotiations would go. Uh, there isn't much history of countries um, engaging in joint procurement with other countries. Um, I mean, we bought quite a lot of... Britain has bought quite a lot of stuff from the Americans, I suppose. Mm. But um, it's just a potential risk, that's all. Um, as for the other things, I mean, the only point I would add is that a fair bit in the financial sector may depend on whether Scotland succeeds in maintaining a currency union with the rest of the UK or whether it has to adopt its own currency. And you would see from my paper that I think the latter is more likely in the end, even though it may start with uh, an attempt to keep the, the same currency. And this is not something that actually governments can entirely decide for themselves. The breakup of the Czech and Slovak monetary union show that the markets can force this quite easily. OK. Uh, I mean, what the, the Fiscal Commission said on the issue of currency was that it would provide clear governance arrangements, um, a shared currency, a framework for financial stability and a consistent regulatory strategy. It would ensure no transaction costs, enhance trade, competition, efficiency and flexibility and be in the interests of both Scotland and the UK and that the risk of an asymmetric shock uh, would be remote and therefore shouldn't inhibit a currency union. Professor Kay, what, what, what do you think of that statement? I think from the point of view of Scotland, uh currency union with England would be the best outcome if it could be negotiated. Uh, I'm sceptical. I was sceptical about whether it could be negotiated even before the various announcements which have been made from Westminster uh, this year. Uh, I don't think the announcements that have been made from Westminster this year rule out the possibility of having a, a currency union if Scotland did indeed vote for independence, but they clearly make it more difficult. Uh, and uh, I think the other options are, as Professor Macron has said, the, um, uh, the independent currency, or, as I have thought about it more, I think the unilateral option may have more to commend it than it it seems at first sight that Scotland would simply go on using the pound anyway in these circumstances. And what would you consider the advantages would be of that uh, scenario? Uh, the advantages really would be the kind of stability and low transactions costs that were described in the Fiscal Commission report that you described. The disadvantage would be, I, I think, who you'd lose some policy flexibility as a result of not being able to change your exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis sterling and, or vis-a-vis or, or -vis the English pound, and you would effectively not have any freedom in monetary policy. But I think the practical reality is that independent Scotland would not really have any freedom in monetary policy anyway. Professor McGregor? Um, I basically agree with, uh, uh, with what's just been said in fact about, uh, about monetary union. I think probably the best outcome for Scotland would be maintenance of a monetary union with the rest of the UK. Just to re-emphasise the points, this is not a costless option, however. It is probably the best option, but it's not costless because within a monetary union, you, of course, give up all right to an independent uh, monetary policy, uh, and that's significant. You also... Uh, almost certainly we will have a, a severe constraints on the overall fiscal stance that you can adopt. 
uh, experience at the Eurozone suggests that, that this is uh, uh, even more uh, of an issue now than, than previously. And so it seems likely that in these circumstances you would be giving up those two uh, significant pairs. Well, not giving you that. Scotland hasn't had them for many years. So uh, there are costs associated with monetary union. There's no question about this in terms of the limitations on the macroeconomic policy stance. However, as has been emphasised, there are major benefits as well. And these are particularly in terms of transactions costs. Uh, and this is really important. And why I think this dominates the arguments is because of the extent of interdependence between Scotland and the rest of the UK, particularly in terms of, of trade flows. And this is asymmetric. I mean, Scotland uh, has a much higher dependence in that sense on the rest of the UK as an export market. Uh, and so, in my judgment as well, I would think that monetary union net would be probably the best, the best outcome for Scotland, but it's not costless. You've, you've talked about the, the Eurozone, but that comprises 17 countries where productivity ranges in Greece to from 40% of Germany's. I mean, uh, g given the fact that the countries, you know, from Netherlands, Finland, etc., st still seem able to exert their own fiscal policies, etc., I mean, why would it be difficult for Scotland as part of our country with only two countries where productivity is not too different to be able to exert their own policies just the way that, uh, you know, uh, certainly the most successful countries in the European, the Eurozone can. Yes, I, th I think, well, I think uh, one of the problems is that the, the degree of integration of the rest of the UK and Scotland makes that more challenging. I think, I think that means that the constraints are probably uh, more severe, uh, if anything, and, and uh, there is a question mark in these circumstances about uh, what you have to ensure is that the fiscal policy stance that, say, an independent Scotland in this case pursues does not threaten the choice of the permanently fixed exchange rate. So, and it's mar markets and market forces will have a major influence on that. So I'm not saying it's not possible I'm, uh, to have a degree of independence in, in, in uh, the fiscal policy stance, but what I'm saying is that it, it's going to be much more constrained uh, under a permanently fixed exchange rate, given that you're committed to maintaining the value of the exchange rate and maintaining the monetary union, than it would be in the absence of a monetary union. Okay, so can, I, can I just add to Of course, this? I think no that the, the problem I see is that I can't imagine a Chancellor of the Exchequer for the remainder of the United Kingdom with no responsibility electorally for Scotland being prepared to put taxpayers at risk in the rest of the country uh, for the sake of Scottish debt or bank debt in Scotland. Um, I just don't think they would do that. And I think that's probably the main reason why we've been hearing that from George Osborne and the others that they, uh, uh, they won't contemplate currency union. But of course, Negotiations will take place and we'll see what happens if in the event of independence. Yeah, when should... I gave my first answer about Standard Life, and uh, one of the points behind that is if people believe something is true, that matters even if it's not true. And we have a similar problem here in that it is now conventional wisdom within the Eurozone that you can only have currency union unless you're on a path towards fiscal union and banking union. Personally, I don't think that's true. But there's almost not much point in our debating whether it's true or not, because people in markets and in political circles today believe it's true. The result of that, I think, is that if Scotland voted for independence and we were to have negotiations over monetary union, you would be getting conditions laid down by the rest of the UK Treasury in these negotiations, which I think would be very difficult for a Scottish government to accept because the, the rest of the UK would be demanding controls over the banking system in Scotland and over the fiscal policy in Scotland, which you would not be willing to concede to a Scottish government vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the UK. And I think that's the almost intractable problem on which uh, these negotiations would fail. That is, there would be a demand for supervision of Scotland's fiscal policy, which either Scotland would concede, in which case you would be conceding most of the economic policy levers you'd hope to gain by independence, or else Scotland would refuse, in which case the monetary union couldn't go ahead in this form. 
Um, Professor McCrone, you also said banking might leave Scotland. I had a meeting, a private meeting, with some senior uh, bankers who said that, in actual fact, the likelihood of, for example, the Royal Bank moving its 3,000 staff to London, where they don't have to find new houses, uh, probably not of the same quality as they have in Edinburgh, or it surrounds schools for their children, have to commute further, the cost of living is actually higher, um, and the cost of the bank having to find premises for all these people to work in is frankly probably zero but in actual fact if they did move um, it would be more about the registration rather than the actual physical um, presence of the banks and their staff what's your view on that well if if that's so that that's good news they of course living in london is much less agreeable than living in edinburgh i mean i've been aware of that for a long time <laughs> uh, but um i'm aware of it too <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, there are, there are a number of points here which perhaps need to be disentangled. Um, if you look at what happened in Iceland, Iceland had uh, banks, one of which had a branch in the UK and the other of which had a subsidiary company in the UK. When Iceland got into real trouble, the British government were looking to the Icelandic government to protect the depositors in the branch but not in the subsidiary because that was of the other bank because that was separately regulated and therefore uh, guaranteed by the UK uh, deposit insurance scheme. Now, I think it would be terribly important for the banks in Scotland to ensure that, uh, that whatever they were doing in England was separately regulated by the uh, government down there and protected by the bank insurance scheme, deposit insurance scheme <coughs> down there. Otherwise, if something goes wrong, they could find themselves with... Um, having to bail out uh, depositors down south who uh, could effectively bankrupt Scotland, really. So I think that's important. And it's not just a question of the depositors. It's also a question of, of the uh, debt. I mean, what happened in Ireland was that the, uh, the, the, the government there decided to honour the debt of the banks, uh, the, 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 the bonds and all the rest of it. And that itself nearly bankrupted the Irish economy. So there are a lot of difficulties here. If the banks move south, they would presumably trade in Scotland through subsidiaries, which would be the Bank of Scotland in the case of Lloyds and the Royal Bank in the case of, of the Royal Bank. And they would be said a subsidiary company is regulated in Scotland. Now, they might do a great deal of the work for the whole group, but that would be a safer situation than having uh, Scotland with major banks located here at risk if something goes wrong with them. We keep coming up against this issue of people believing things are true, even if they're not or shouldn't be true. And I think in this discussion, we've yet another one, which is we've created the idea that if a bank erects a bar brass plate in some location saying this is our headquarters, then the taxpayers of the country where that brass plate is located become liable for all the debts of that bank. That seems to me a very strange idea, and the uh, Scottish Government should be it uh, in great haste to say that as far as Scotland is concerned, it's not true. As far as Ireland as a, was concerned, it was true as a result of a rather foolish commitment given overnight by the Irish finance ministers. It does seem that currently the UK Government and uh, American governments believe that it is true, and the German government certainly acts as if it's true, I think they'll discover it's going to cost them a lot of money one day. And I think uh, Dr. Macron is right that uh, RBS would move its brass plate from, uh, from Scotland to London. I don't think that matters at all. I think for the reasons you've described, uh, I don't think RBS is going to move 3,000 or other numbers of Goga Burn staff from, uh, from Scotland to London. I can't, I can't see why it should. But I think the subsidiarisation point is extremely important. So long as the EU rules remain as they are, uh, then, and this is true in both banking and insurance, a Scottish government should make sure that to the extent that when Scottish insurance companies or banks operate outside Scotland, that they operate outside Scotland through subsidiaries in the countries concerned, uh, rather than as branches, so that Scottish 
depositors, policyholders, taxpayers are not on the hook for these activities that take place outside Scotland. Thank you. Now, I'm keen to move on and, and uh, ensure that I have my own self-denying ordinance, as I mentioned earlier on, so I can't cover every topic. But I'm going to move on to another one, which is actually in your own paper, uh, um, uh, Professor McCrone, um, before moving on to an issue in, in uh, Professor McGregor's, and that's the issue of quantitative easing. Um, we had quite an interesting debate, I think, last week. I don't know if you, if you saw any of it. Uh, but uh, on the issue of quantitative easing and the issue about whether this actually matters in terms of uh, overall debt because of the, the Treasury not uh, charging itself interest. Um, and uh, Dr uh, Jim Cuthbert uh, was trying to make the point, uh, and very persuasively, I think, uh, for some of us at least, that uh, this shouldn't really be included in Scotland's debt figures, and indeed, um, you know, it sh it, the, it's currently impacting on JERS figures, and it shouldn't. Well, what, what's your own view of the quantitative easing issue? Because you, you've, you've talked about it in some detail well, in, in your report. Sorry, you said, and I quote, how this might affect Scotland's inherited share of the debt is far from clear, but needs to be taken into account in any negotiations. So how should it? Well, it was Jim Gusbert's original paper that drew my attention to this, actually. Um, and I think it's a very important issue. It's not one that many people understand, and certainly few people have ever talked about it. But 30% of the UK's debt is now held by the Bank of England, roughly. Uh, and that, the interest that's paid on that is simply returned to the Treasury. So, in effect, George Osborne's borrowing all that money for nothing at all in the way of cost. So, actually, the burden of UK debt is nothing like as bad as is often made out. Um, if Scotland was going to take a share of UK debt, then the negotiators need to be aware of this uh, because it should, it's an issue for the negotiation. It would be wrong, it seems to me, if Scotland took a GDP share or a population share of UK debt uh, and left the remainder of the UK with all the stuff that the Bank of England has on which they're paying nothing. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's an important issue, it seems to me. Um, now, what will happen to this in the end? I don't know. Nobody knows. I mean, the, the notion was that originally the Bank of England would simply sell that debt on the market. If they do that, then, of course, the government has to start paying the interest on it. So they won't be very enthusiastic about that. Um, if, on the other hand, it just sits there for a long time, you could imagine a situation in which an incoming government some years hence might say, well, what the hell is all this debt doing sitting in the Bank of England? We're not paying any interest on it. Why don't we just cancel it? And that would reduce the UK debt overnight by 30%. So, <laughs> so it's, a, it's an important issue, but I don't, I don't know how it would be resolved. Uh, Professor Key? Uh, I mean, this goes back to the monetary union. If there were a monetary union, then I would think the Bank of England would continue exactly as it is. And there wouldn't be the issue of dividing up the assets and liabilities of the Bank of England between the, the, the two independent countries. If, on the other hand, the, the Bank of England were not to continue as the monetary authority for the entire British Isles, uh, then the Bank of England would have to be divided up in some sense. And that raises the question of what happens to the various assets and liabilities of the Bank of England, including these. And this is a real wet towel issue. I can imagine, you know, months of discussion and negotiation as to how you actually resolve this particular question. Because to determine what the assets and liabilities of a central bank, which has this capacity to print money and can only have the kind of balance sheets it does because it has that power, is, uh, is very complicated. But I think the key point is right, that the, the national debt is not quite what it seems because the Bank of England owns almost 40% of it. Um, and that this is part of any negotiation uh, has to be taken into account and it's part of the total negotiations over the monetary arrangements for independent Scotland. Professor McGregor, you were nodding vigorously there. At the yes, I basically have nothing to add. I, I, I agree with that, that position. It needs to be taken into account in, in negotiations. Does that mean you think that Scotland's actual share of the debt should be less as a money, uh, monetary yes. pro, uh, sum uh, if this quantitative easing is Yes, going I to think that probably uh, is the implication. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, now, I'm going yes, to, as uh, I said... I, th I, think, um, I think I'm right in saying, and others will correct me if I'm wrong, 
that under the European Union rules, if Scotland is in the European Union, it would have to have its own central bank in the same way as all the other countries in the European Union have central banks, although the European central bank is the one with the money creation powers. I think that's right, but the, the Scottish central bank could just be a man in an office in George Street. With a... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope he's remunerated better than members of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Um, yes. Professor McGregor, moving on to your own paper, um, you, you uh, looked at, uh, because of course this committee isn't just talking about the post-independence scenario, we've got to look at uh, the, the, the other side of the coin if uh, Scotland votes no, and you've said um, on the second page of your uh, submission, of all the independence and pro-union proposals for further fiscal powers uh, that are in the public domain, the Common Core is in fact the Labour Party's plans, since these are the most modest to date. All other parties' proposed plans that are more radical in terms of control of the income tax system as a whole and the set of taxes that were under Scottish control. And you go on to um, discuss what would happen if that was implemented. For example, you say that uh, your preliminary analysis of the long-run output and employment effects of setting the SRIT at 15% under conventional bargaining, if that happens, which of course it may not, would result in a 3% fall in GDP with a slightly smaller fall in employment. And you give a graph uh, indicating that now, given that Scotland's employment is about 2.575 million and GDP about 140 bil billion, you're talking about potentially 75,000 job losses and um, uh, a, a loss of four and a half billion in GDP. However, you've went on to say that if there was a willingness of workers to accept a lower take-home wage, the opposite might be true in that uh, GDP could increase by one and a half percent and employment by about two percent or 50,000. Um, I'm just wondering if you can talk to us a wee bit through your, your kind of thinking on this particular issue, which I found quite fascinating. Um, and if there is to be a level of um, wage decline, the result of this policy, what would be the kind of equilibrium decline that would provide the additional employment and GDP, which is suggested in your figures? Uh, thanks, convener. Um, <laughs> firstly, just to mention that when I said the Labour Party plans were uh, the most modest uh, in inverted commas. Uh, it was of those in the public domain, so we don't know what they're being into, right? So, um, so uh, and what, what I try to do here is look at a common core of, of proposals that are sh would be shared, uh, uh, powers, tax powers that, that, that are common across a number of different uh, parties, pro-union parties and, and uh, of course, independence, and, and look at what the impact of actually using these powers may be. Now, I think it has to be said that as far as I'm aware, no party in Scotland has yet committed itself to any radical change in tax. I'm not aware of any commitment to do anything other than maintain parity uh, in tax rates with the rest of the UK. But nonetheless, given that these powers, all of the powers being proposed are really quite significant. Uh, one may be modest relative to the others, but they're all quite significant. It seems worth exploring what, what the exercise of those powers would be. And I, I emphasise in, in the paper that, that uh, clearly having the power and then using the power are two quite different things. And when using the power, presumably the Scottish Government wishes to anticipate what the likely impact uh, of those changes might be. And what, what we've done here is explore uh, a simple illustrative case to, to make a couple of uh, points. And, and when when we have a, a tax rise and an equal increase in, in government expenditure, there are kind of two main countervailing effects that are set in motion. On, on the one hand, there tends to be a stimulus to demand because government expenditure increases, private consumption declines, but net that stimulates demand. On the other hand, you tend to have an adverse competitiveness effect uh, because the normal view is that workers bargain for a net of tax real wage. And if that's the case, as taxes rise, they push for an increase in nominal wages to compensate them and move them back to a position in which the real wage is constant, uh, is maintained. If that happens, uh, now, you cannot in general predict which of these forces uh, will predominate, but the more open the economy, the more important the competitiveness, the adverse competitiveness effects. Scotland's highly open. In our default model, we find that net there is a negative impact, that the adverse competitiveness effects outweigh the other effects, when bargaining takes place over a net of tax real wage. But if workers <laughs> are persuaded um, that, that what they ought to be considering is the notion of a social wage, that is to say, 
if, if unions, for example, were to value uh, the services provided by the enhanced government expenditure, uh, then you have a countervailing an, a, an effect that moderates, can moderate the extent of the competitiveness effect. The case I've, we've chosen to illustrate here, just to make the point very emphatically, is to say, well, suppose it were the case that workers felt as well off after the change. That is to say, they valued the government services as, uh, as much as they valued their loss of disposable income, and they reflected that in their wage bargains. This would mean that the adverse competitiveness impact would, would be negated, uh, and in fact there would be no adverse competitiveness effect in that particular case. And in that case, what you get is a conventional kind of Keynesian response to a, a, a net stimulus to, to demand and, and, the, and the economy uh, expands. In that case, how you are right, in that case, however, uh, and it happens because, and there's a greater proportionate stimulus to employment in that case, because the real wage declines in this case. People are accepting a reduction in, in the real take-home pay because they value the quality of the public services that have been provided in, in exchange for that. And, and that's the mechanism. Now, the strength of these forces are, are very difficult to tie down. The, uh, we have some evidence on attitudes that might suggest people are a little sceptical about the traditional view that, that uh, Scots prefer the high tax, high expenditure Scandinavian end of the spectrum to the low tax, low spending uh, Baltic states end of the spectrum. But, but um, it matters. It seems to matter a great deal in, in determining the, the, the net impact of the fiscal change. And what would be the impact of, of in people's wages in terms of percentages? A, a very good point. I can't remember the precise uh, number. Uh, I think it's of the order of 2%, but I'll check that and get back to you. I've, 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 I'm, I'm sorry I didn't bring the full results with, of the simulations with me, but it's a significant, you know, a cut in the real wage, the, the real take on pay. The point being, though, under the hypothesis, workers feel compensated for this in terms of the quality of the public services that have been provided as a consequence, and that's why they're not pushing for a higher wage. Okay. Professor McCrone or Professor Cage, wish to comment on, on that? Well, uh, the only point I would make, because I haven't done the kind of study that uh, Peter McGregor has done, um, because Scotland has been so integrated with the rest of the United Kingdom, that reduces the scope, it seems to me, for differences in tax without some sort of adverse effects. Um, they will constantly be compared across the border uh, in a way which between the Scandinavian <coughs> countries they probably are not, at least not to the same extent. Uh, that would mean big differences in tax might result in some people shifting, for example, uh, and people you didn't want to lose, entrepreneurs, people like that. Um, but small differences I don't think would be any more significant in that respect than differences in um, council tax or domestic or non-domestic non rates. Professor Key. I really agree with the thrust of both of these observations. Firstly, because the UK is integrated, whatever the constitutional arrangements, you know, Scotland couldn't have tax rates that were 15% different. It could maybe have tax rates that were 3 or 5% different, but there are clearly limits to that. And if it did, and we imagine, as I, I suspect we mostly do, that uh, an independent Scotland would have a somewhat higher tax, higher expenditure base uh, than it does at the moment, then a corollary of that, assuming that money doesn't grow on trees from somewhere, and I don't think it does, is that Scots would have rather lower uh, real take-home wages than they do now, whether they bargain for it or, uh, or not, in fact, that that's just an inescapable arithmetic outcome. And that, that's the reality of the kind of world we're, we're describing. I think it's worth saying that a lot of the people who comment on all this in the newspapers argue for a more, a less unequal society, uh, a better provision of social services and all the rest of it. And I favour that too. The only thing is that these people never actually say much about the tax implications of that. And you can't have more generous benefits and better social security and a better health service and all the other things unless you have more tax. So, you know, Scandinavian taxes are actually a lot higher than ours at the moment. And the question is whether people will accept that or not. And we don't know the answer to that.
Clearly that issue, if you look at purchasing power parity in Scandinavia, is that even though they've got greater taxes, they also have significantly higher wages, so therefore their purchasing power is at least as high as the UK, if not higher, with the additional services. Well, that's true, of course. Uh, and the Norwegians will tell you they don't mind paying higher taxes because they have very good public services. But, uh, because they've said that to me, but, uh, you know, we don't know what the Scottish electorate would actually think about this, and that's, that's the, the crucial issue, I think. But surely, you know, because they've got higher disposable income, as, as I've just said, as well as better services, it's about the size of their economy and economic growth as well as it has to come into yeah, play. Yeah, I mean, economic growth is key to all of this, actually. Uh, if you can make the Scottish economy grow faster, you can solve all sorts of problems. But we don't actually quite know how we can do that at the moment. At least I don't. Um, OK. Right, I'm going to let uh, members of the committee in who are all champing at the bit. The first person to ask questions will be Jamie, to be followed by Malcolm. Thank you very much, uh, convener, and uh, focusing on your uh, paper, uh, Professor uh, McCrone. I thought it was interesting you referred uh, to the uh, work by the Institute of Fiscal Studies, as, uh, suggesting that there could be challenges ahead uh, for uh, Scotland. But I, I thought that was an interesting point to make because previously uh, at the, this committee we have had uh, an array of uh, uh, witnesses. Uh, suggest that uh, that paper, the paper that you're referring to, the Institute of Fiscal Studies paper, was misunderstood. Professor David Bell told us that he thought the IFS was well misunderstood and that it was a projection. In other words, it was based on things not changing in policy terms. Uh, Angus Armstrong, uh, it's almost inevitable that projections will not be correct as they predict the outcome on the basis of current policies. Indeed, Professor McGregor was at that uh, session suggested uh, something similar in relation to the IFS's uh, population projections. So, would you, you accept that that the, the, the IFS is essentially uh, their, their work is predicating nothing changing? Well, the IFS said that their, their, their paper was just arithmetic. Uh, they were, you know, working out what would happen. The, the two points which are important, I think, in this are: North Sea oil appears to be declining in terms of revenues. We're certainly well past the peak of production. Uh, we don't really know what future revenues will be because it all depends on a whole lot of things like the price of oil and the cost of getting the oil out of the ground and one thing and another. But the general expectation is that North Sea oil revenues will decline. They have already declined quite a bit, which is why uh, the Scottish uh, GERs thing uh, shows that Scotland will be in bigger deficit this year than the rest of the, than the UK as a whole, which is the first time that has appeared for several years. Um, so that's one thing, North Sea Oil. The other one is the uh, ageing of the Scottish population, which is at a faster rate than for the UK as a whole, mainly because we haven't had so much immigration as the rest of the UK has had, or other parts of the UK have had. So you have to take account of these two things, and that is why I think there would be a challenging situation for an independent Scotland after independence. But the, so the question was more: Do you accept, though, that essentially the IFS work, IFS work was based on, on nothing particularly changing? They weren't making forecasts; they were just doing arithmetic, as they said. So you can't treat it really as a forecast. But it does illustrate that there are these two key issues. I think. Now, if you can somehow greatly improve Scotland's economic growth, then that could resolve these questions. But um, we don't quite know how that's going to be done. And as for the North Sea oil, there is a good deal of difference between the OBR estimates for North Sea oil in the next few years compared with the Scottish Government's own estimates. And the Scottish Government's own estimates are now fairly old, so uh, we need new ones. I don't know if the other witnesses want to comment in relation to... I know Professor McGregor said something in the past at the IFS. Yes, I mean, firstly, let me say I think the IFS... Uh, deserve their uh, excellent reputation, but I think it is the case that these are projections and they are mechanistic, they're comparatively mechanical, they make quite a number of assumptions and if you change those assumptions you get different results and one of those assumptions is kind of an unchanged policy stance in some sense uh, and I think that's uh, potentially uh, significant. Um, the ageing one is particularly difficult because uh, of migration is dependence on migration. I mean, we, these population projections typically are based on very mechanical projections forward of, of the current, the current population, and these are very sensitive. Particularly, people of working age are very sensitive to what happens to migration. Now, of course, IFS are aware of that, but the assumptions that you make about these issues uh, are important, and they can alter 
the conclusions of the analysis. None of this is to deny that the North Sea oil revenue issue is a real issue and that ageing is a real issue. It's just that the precise combination of these and, and, and other things that might be done uh, is difficult to predict. Professor McCrone, obviously you've provided us a, a very useful um, a submission for uh, today, but you're also the author of uh, a fairly well-known report now, uh, back in the 1970s for uh, the UK government. In that report, you said Scotland would tend to be in chronic surplus to quite a, a quite embarrassing uh, degree. And Dennis Healy, who was the Chancellor at the time that report was circulating in Whitehall, told Hollywood magazine uh, recently that the UK government did underplay the value of the oil to the country. And Jim Cuthbert just last week uh, uh, highlighted the cabinet minutes from the 15th of December 1977, where an oil fund was discounted for some of these very uh, reasons. Given that the value was underplayed in the past, and given that uh, people weren't told that an independent Scotland would tend to be in chronic surplus to an embarrassing degree by the UK government, what might the people of Scotland not be getting to <coughs> now? Well, I was being what I thought was honest in 1974. Um, Various people have said the paper was hushed up and should have been published. And it's quite interesting in that connection that Sir Nicholas McPherson has recently been getting into trouble for publishing his paper. I mean, the fact is that you don't normally publish briefing for ministers. Uh, and if I'd published it, I'd have been kicked out of the civil service, I suspect, pretty sharply, uh, because civil servants don't publish their submissions to ministers. And, you know, ministers in the Scottish government will find exactly the same thing. So that's the first point. The second one is, of course, there was an enormous expectation of huge oil revenues in the early 1980s. I wrote that in 1974. Um, I'd forgotten I'd written it at all until somebody unearthed it through um, uh, the usual method of getting stuff out of uh, secret information. But I, when I read it again, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. In fact, the oil revenues that I predicted were slightly lower than the ones that actually took place. I said about three, 3 billion, I thought, in 1980, and it was 3.7 billion in 1980-81. The figures for output were the ones that were everybody knew at the time. They were actually already published by the Department of Trade and Industry. It was simply a matter of, of trying to make a calculation of what the revenues ought to be based on that output. And that was actually quite difficult because the Conservative government had not put appropriate tax measures in place by that time, by the time they left office. So it remained for the Labour government to introduce petroleum revenue tax, to set up the British National Oil Corporation, to do all the other things that they did in order to ensure that the country got a decent share of the revenue and it didn't all just go to private shareholders sitting in America or wherever they were. So, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a fairly uncertain thing. I'm rather pleased that I managed to calculate the revenues as accurately as I did for 1980. Um, but the situation now is completely different. I mean, th at that time, I mean, the, the equivalent, if you go back in, uh, in the present day sort of prices, you, you get up to, uh, you know, about 30 billion uh, oil revenues at that time. Uh, you know, in fact, it was 12 billion in the prices of the day. But if you, if you put it into real terms, it's about 30 billion. So yeah, they were huge. Uh, and they would, of course, if Scotland had been independent, have had a profound effect on the whole situation here. In fact, one of the problems would have been what the hell to do with them, because they would have pushed up the exchange rate and put the rest of industry out of business if you weren't careful. And that's why the Norwegians set up their oil fund, and why their oil fund invests abroad, so as to try and help to control the pressure on the exchange rate. So there are a lot of issues here, but I, I mean, this paper has become rather notorious because it was got under freedom of information. But uh, actually, it was the situation then. It's not the situation now. I accept that, and uh, I mean, I'm not saying there was anything wrong with your report. I am not suggesting it was your responsibility as a civil servant at the time to release that information. And I suppose the point I'm making is that it informed the UK government of the actual position, and the UK government did not impart that information. They took the decision not to impart that information, and it begets the question... I suppose, to be fair, it may not be a question you can uh, answer with any certainty, um, but it almost certainly isn't one. But, you know, is that happening now? The only way we'll find out is if that information is released 30 years hence, and that could be, and you just referred to an opportunity missed uh, back then, that could be an opportunity missed <coughs> now, depending well, on Well, I don't, I don't, I mean, obviously I don't know, but I don't believe anything's being hushed up now. Uh, I don't think things were actually hushed up then. It just was that that paper wasn't published. 
Um, and, I'm not know, sure we'll, I'll agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, turning to uh, uh, Professor... I may say, I might just add, actually, that I wrote a second paper, which has not been unearthed so far, <laughs> in, which, in, which, in which I recommended an oil fund, amongst other things. Well, we'll get looking for that one then. <laughs> uh, and thanks for the heads up. Uh, <laughs> Professor uh, McGregor, uh, in your submission, I thought it was interesting... And, of course, the, the, the first part of your statement is, is, is a matter of fact. The outcome of the referendum is, of course, uh, uncertain. You then go on to say it seems clear that future Scottish governments will possess substantial ha ha enhanced tax powers relative to the current position. Uh, and then you refer to Scotland that. But you also then go on to say all of the pro-union bodies' proposals for further devolution in the event of no vote that are in the public domain imply significant additional powers. But you would accept, would you not, that there is no guarantee that those will actually be delivered? We know... If we get a yes vote on the 18th of September 2014, Scotland will go on to become an independent, sovereign state. If we vote no, there's no guarantee that these powers will actually come to here in Scotland. And indeed, there's, there's precedent here, isn't there? I can think of uh, Alec Douglas Hume telling us to vote no in 1979 for enhanced evolution, which didn't happen. Or more recently, the Calm Commission proposing the most significant powers that were actually delivered. By the Scotland Act 2012. So, would you accept that? There's no guarantee we won't know. Well, what I'd say is the only absolute guarantee is is that there will be uh, additional fiscal powers because of the Scotland Act 2012, and that's the only decision that seems to me to be absolutely certain and going to be implemented. And that's why I've kind of considered that as illustrative of the Common Core. It's uh, okay. The Labour Party's proposals go rather further than that. But uh, uh, that's, the, if you like, the irreducible common core because it's already been decided. Everything else is uncertain, I would say. Um, but what this analysis does is give a flavour of, of the types of impacts that could uh, arise if, if the powers are actually used. As I say, as, a, as far as I'm aware, nobody's committed yet to varying the Scottish rate of income tax from the rest of the UK income tax, in Wait, which case... I understand that point. Obviously, that is that's manifestly <laughs> correct. The only thing we know is, uh, 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 as far as the uh, Scotland Act has been passed and the powers yes. uh, set out therein, but looking at the referendum itself, yes. we know that if we vote yes, we move on to become uh, an independent state. If we vote no, we do not know that these powers will actually come to Scotland. There's no guarantee. I think there's no guarantee. No, that's correct. Okay. And also, you, you, you refer... Uh, uh, to uh, uh, the situation under all of these uh, pro-union plans in the public domain, the Scottish Parliament have comparatively limited influence on the overall fiscal policy uh, uh, stance. I'm just wondering what the, the consequences of this limited, in limited influence might be from your perspective. Well, it, it, it's simply, I believe that that's uh, actually true. Now, OK, to different degrees, let me emphasise, but this is, came, came up earlier. I, delete, I believe that that's true, actually, of any of the proposals for constitutional change, including independence. Of course, it's less true uh, of independence than it is of the other, but if we're talking about independence under a monetary union with the rest of the UK, and we've been through these arguments earlier on, and Professor Kay uh, reminded us of the importance of the Bank of England uh, and its, its uh, uh, undoubted attempts to influence the fiscal policy stance in Scotland, I, I would say that all of the current proposals for constitutional change, including independence, imply a degree of restriction on, on the overall fiscal policy stance. But, of course, I would accept that, that the extent of restriction will vary uh, among the different proposals and, and would be greatest in the case of independence. I'm not sure how great that, that would depend. So can you talk in the context of the, the other proposals what, what the restrictions might be? Well, what I'm th thinking of here is that, as far as I'm aware, um, of course, there are borrowing, there are borrowing proposals in, in the Scotland Act, and, and these are important, uh, uh, but focused on capital spending, which is important uh, as well. But I, I don't think that uh, the other proposals, as pro-union proposals, imply uh, any great measure of control over the aggregate fiscal stance in terms of the difference between government expenditure and, and taxation and the ability to run deficit-financed uh, uh, expansions, for example. Okay. I think that's right. I mean, I think the, the, the big difference is that a, an independent Scotland would have to have regard to what its budget was and what the deficit was and, and uh, keep that under control. I mean, the, 
the general rule which the European Union have is that they should be under the deficit should be less than three percent of GDP. Um, there is no requirement in the case of regions in a country, which is what Scotland would be if the no vote prevails, economically anyhow, uh, to uh, have any particular sort of balance in your budget. I mean, the idea is that expenditure should in some way be related to needs and taxation should be related to tax taxable capacity. And, for example, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, there is uh, a lower taxable capacity and a higher level of public expenditure. In Wales, there has a, is a lower level of taxable capacity, but a smaller level of public expenditure than in Scotland. But the overall deficit in Wales is probably larger than it is in Scotland because the taxable capacity is less. And you can go around the various regions. The figures are not very adequate now, but the northern region is probably in much the same position as Wales. London has a higher level of public expenditure than any of the English regions and more similar to the level of public expenditure in Scotland. But it also has very high tax revenue. Okay, uh, Malcolm to follow by Jean. I was very interested in Professor Kay's comment that he didn't think there would be a monetary union because the, uh, the very tight fiscal controls um, that would be required would not be acceptable to the Scottish Government, which did remind me, I think, of what I thought was a key point of Sir Nicholas Ferguson, um, McPherson's note, because I think he made that point that the, the, the fiscal controls would be too tight. So, assuming for the purposes of this question, although I also assume it anyway, that there will not be a monetary union, I'm really interested in what the consequences of that will be. Now, Professor Macron seems to... Uh, I'm not sure whether you want it because that's the best scenario or whether you say it's going to happen anyway because of the markets. But anyway, for whatever reason, if it's going to happen, I'm interested in what the consequences would be because that doesn't seem to me to, be, to get spelled out to any great extent in current debates. So you mentioned transaction costs, which I think are well known, but I wonder what the effect on interest rates would be and on any other aspects of uh, economic and financial uh, matters. Well, I think whether there's monetary union or not, there would be separate Scottish debt, and that would probably be at a slightly higher rate of interest than UK debt, for the simple reason that the UK has a long record of not defaulting on its debt. Scotland has no such record unless you go back to the Darien scheme, and that's something that we all want to forget. So uh, it would have to establish itself as a credible borrower, and in the meantime, and also because it, it would be a much smaller participant, participant in the market, uh, for all these reasons I would expect the interest rate on Scottish debt to be a bit higher than for the UK as a whole, and that's particularly the case if there's, uh, if, if there's independence. Uh, with monetary union, that would still happen, it seems to be. Uh, and that, could, that would probably be reflected in things like uh, mortgage rates and various other things across the economy. And how big would that difference be? We don't know. I think it's the National Institute have suggested something between 0.6 and 1.8 or something of, uh, of GDP. So it would be quite significant, but it would be copable with, I suppose. But it does mean that if you're having to pay more interest on your accumulated debt, that affects your budgetary situation. It means that your budget deficit is bigger than it would otherwise be. But what would, what would be the additional uh, interest rates if there wasn't a monetary union, assuming that there would be some? Because I'm trying to... Te if, if there are no extra negatives, apart from transaction costs, to not having a monetary union, it's not quite clear to me why the Scottish Government is so adamant that there must be a monetary union. Well, if there... If there is a monetary union, then um, it makes all these things a bit easier. If there's no monetary union, then there's more of a risk that uh, the exchange rate might be altered, either by force or by design at some stage. And if the market thinks that there could be a change in the exchange rate, then that tends to be reflected in, in interest rates. So you tend to get a bigger difference in interest rates. Um, on the whole, I think that a separate currency but one pegged to sterling is probably the long-run answer. Uh, that's what the Irish did for a long time, uh, and then they unpegged it when they went into the, into the European exchange rate mechanism. Um, small countries very often do that. I mean, the Danes, for example, have kept their own currency, but it's pegged to the euro. But that means they can alter it if they really have to. And the pressures on Scotland's balance of payments would be rather different from the UK as a whole because of the oil. Um, if the oil price went up, then the, uh, the pressure would be, tend to be to lift the Scottish exchange rate. If the oil price dropped dramatically, the, the tendency would be to 
uh, push the balance of payments into deficit, and, and uh, you know uh, that would tend to be reflected in in uh, in, in the exchange rate. Um, so, the, 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 it, it, although the two economies are very similar in many respects, that because of the oil, there is one a big one big difference between them. Do the other two uh, professors agree about the interest rates uh, comments that Professor McCrone has made? Uh, no, I don't altogether. I'm not, I, think, I think all of this is rather complicated, and we need to talk about, first of all, about what scenarios we're, we're looking at. Professor McCrone has talked about pegs now, and mentioned Ireland and Denmark. Now, they're different. In the case of Denmark, there's a Danish kroner, which is, and always has been, which is now fixed pegged at, I think, it's 7.5 kroner to the euro. In the Irish case, when Ireland became independent going back to 1921-22, uh, Ireland didn't actually peg the Irish pound to the pound sterling. Ireland actually didn't do anything at all. Things continued just as if political independence in Ireland had never happened. And there were Irish private commercial bank issued notes which circulated in Ireland did not circulate, circulate in Northern Ireland, but not in, in the UK, which were like Scottish banknotes now backed by English pounds. And there wasn't even an Irish currency board until the late 1920s, at which time Ireland, uh, the Irish government, did start issuing Irish banknotes. But these Irish banknotes were actually backed at that time by Bank of England, notes. It wasn't until I think it was 1941 or 1942 that Ireland actually set, uh, set up its own central bank. Now we don't have quite the leisurely pace that characterised either Ireland then or global financial markets then today. Uh, but there are a lot of different variants <coughs> on these options. Now that isn't answering your question, no, well, okay. but, uh, it, 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 but it's, it's quite it, helpful. Thank you. Can it's I, can I, I move relevant on? background um, to it. Um, Jamie Hepburn referred, referred to the Institute of Fiscal Studies looking way into the future, and clearly that has its difficulties. But just concentrating on the immediately post-independence period, if there is a yes vote, uh, I'm wondering um, what your assessment of the fiscal situation for an independent Scotland would be. I think our witnesses last week tended to say that it would be more fiscally challenging than um, the rest of the UK would face. Uh, I wonder what your assessment of the fiscal situation facing an independent Scotland in 2016 would be. Um, Professor McRoon? Well, I think it would be more challenging um, because already the uh, figures show that the deficit in Scotland is slightly larger than for the UK as a whole, 8.3 compared with 7.3% of GDP. And if oil revenues go on declining, then that's a pressure which will make it worse. Uh, I, think that, I think it would be fiscally, fiscally challenging because a, a lot of promises have been made, uh, some of them quite expensive, and I don't see that the revenue is going to be there to match all these promises. So I think it's going to be, I think it would be quite a, a tough situation. I think it's... Uh, Professor McGregor, have you got any comment on that? Well, uh, just uh, I think broadly I, I agree with that. I think it's, it looks likely... Uh, that the situation we, will be more challenging, but but the you know public sector deficits are notoriously difficult to predict accurately because of the difference between two very big uh, numbers, and they depend on a whole load of other things. Uh, what's happening in the rest of the economy, so difficult to predict. But I'd say uh, on, on the basis of present evidence that it's likely to be more challenging. I think, uh, which is not to say that. You know, if, if policies were pursued that were successful by an independent Scottish government, that generated more economic growth. But there's a puzzle as to exactly how you would generate that. But if you were successful in doing that, then you can grow your, grow your way out of a, a fiscal problem. So I, yeah, well, I, I accept that in, in principle, but obviously yes. that would take a year yes. or two, so I was concentrating on the immediate period. Yeah. So my final question is actually to Professor McCrone. Both in your book and in your paper, you talk about... Um, options for fiscal, further fiscal devolution. And I was interested in particular <coughs> on why, while you're a supporter of further uh, devolution uh, of control over income tax, you are not in favor of uh, 
that being uh, completely devolved to the Scottish Parliament. So I, I was interested in what your thinking about that was, although since I'm asking you about another of your proposals is also of interest, that's my primary question. I suppose my secondary one was why, you're, why you, were, you were keen on the assignment of uh, VAT revenues uh, as well. But, but, but my main interest is in the income tax question. Well, on the income tax thing, I've thought quite a lot about this, and there are, of course, a number of people who have suggested that the whole of income tax should be devolved. The trouble about that is it leaves the UK government with taxes that are mainly regressive. So if the UK government has to raise more money all of a sudden because of some disaster or because of a war or whatever reason, VAT would go up uh, and income tax would not, or at least and not, they wouldn't be able to put it up. So I thought that there ought to be uh, some tax still available to the UK government which was not regressive but was progressive. Uh, which would mean that, uh, that uh, you see, I think in the, in the last, uh, in this recession, personally, I would have not put VAT up. I would have put something extra on income tax because it would have hit the poorer people less hard. So that's the main reason why I uh, shied off advocating devolving the whole of income tax. As for VAT, I mean, various people have said to me, this is simply pointless, uh, uh, assigning the revenue from VAT. I don't think that's true for, for various reasons. I mean, obviously, you can't alter the rate of VAT within one country. That's against the European Union rules. But if you assign it, uh, then if the Scottish Government is actually successful in generating more economic growth, then it'll get more taxation, but taxation revenue. And that seems to me... A lot of the people who've argued about, about uh, giving Scotland more tax powers have said that the Government needs to have the ability to get additional tax revenues if it's successful in promoting growth. And so you would get that if you assigned a VAT, and that seems to be quite important. The other point about it is that um, in England there's a fair amount of pressure uh, along the lines that Scotland gets more public expenditure than it deserves, that the Barnett formula is too generous and all that kind of thing. And while nobody has made a commitment to that, I think eventually somebody's got to look at this again. Uh, I don't know when, but sometime in the future. I think the pressure on this would be a bit reduced if Scotland was seen to be raising more of its own money from its own taxation, so that the, the block grant would be considerably smaller. Uh, those are the two main reasons why I, I recommended those things. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jean, to be followed by Michael. Um, I've had so many questions in my head since we started this discussion, but I, I would quite like just to ask you um, about the, the, the current economy of, of the United Kingdom, because we, the, there is a kind of inference that, you know, everything is okay the way it is, so don't upset the apple cart. But there are many economists and a lot of people who feel that everything is not okay, um, and that actually we could make a much better stab at it, frankly. One of the, the earlier session today, we were looking at the forecast by the OBR, and I think one of the things that, that stood out for me was the, and I quote from their paper, firstly, the expected pick-up in house prices in Scotland, although property transactions have picked up recently, they remain well below their long-run trend. But all of that suggests a kind of getting back to normal after we've paid off a debt scenario. And that seems, uh, I think, to a lot of people to be headlong straight into the kind of uh, extraordinary economic mess that we are struggling to change. So we can't, uh, my question to you really is, how do we affect change from a Scottish perspective without actually changing something? We'll probably get different answers from all three of us on this question. Um, I'd, I'd rather agree with what you have said. I mean, it, uh, th many people misunderstand uh, the situation that we got into with the financial crash. It wasn't government debt that was the main problem. The, the uh, levels of government debt were maybe a bit, should have been a bit lower than they were, and maybe uh, the chance of the checkers and the Labour government should have been budgeting for a surplus when they had something like a 3 or 4% deficit. But it, the deficit was not actually the problem. The problem was the private debt, which escalated more and more and more until eventually it could escalate no further. And then the thing collapsed. That turns into government debt because the government then finds that its tax revenue is reduced 
and that its expenditure on things like unemployment benefit have gone up, and so you then find that the government debt goes up. But that was a consequence of what happened rather than any uh, adverse planning by the government itself. Now, are we getting, heading for the same situation again? Well, I, I personally am worried about what's happening in the housing market. I think housing, house prices in Britain are probably too high anyway. I think that uh, countries like Germany, where there's a much smaller owner-occupied sector and a much better and bigger social rented sector, uh, are at an advantage because they don't get themselves into this kind of <coughs> pickle. And so I think there is a danger that we fall into the same trap again. Usually, after a recession like this, if the exchange rate goes down and exports in, improve, as they did, for instance, in the early 90s, that's the best way out of it. Um, but it's very difficult to get exports to improve, even if the exchange rate were to go down at the moment, because the, uh, the markets to which we export are also depressed. That's the main difficulty. The, Euro, the Eurozone is in, in as much, quite as much trouble as we are. So, yes, I am a bit worried that we haven't learned the lessons and that we get back into the same pickle as we were in before. How would the Scottish Government deal with this? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think it's very difficult to say. But I would like to see a policy which uh, changed housing policy fairly considerably. I think we have a global financial sector and system which is set up to generate endemic financial crises. And what we saw in 2008 was simply one of a series which I would expect to continue. I think the capacity of the UK government unilaterally to do much about that is very limited. I think the capacity of a Scottish government to do something about that is is a good deal smaller. I think the best either a UK government or a Scottish government can do is uh, see what small steps it can take to insulate either the UK or the Scottish economy from the consequences. Uh, but the capacity to do that is, I think, also quite limited. I think we need to accept uh, that in any society, even the richest, uh, th the distribution of income is such that the poorer people in the society can't afford the full economic cost of their housing. And encouraging people to buy housing when they can't really afford it has been one of the problems that, uh, that has, has, has arisen. And that is why I like the Scandinavian situation and the German situation where there is a decent provision of social rented housing and less emphasis on encouraging people to buy houses when they can't really afford it. By implication, that would be a, a, a good uh, idea to, to, for Scotland to govern itself. I mean, well, we, we, yeah, we moved I mean, away from any possibility. It's of something that a Scottish government could do, certainly if it was independent. It could also move in this direction if it was simply given more devolution powers. I think the it more should be spent on social housing. You can take the constitutional implications of that any way you like. <laughs> I, th I think it clearly depends on the extent to which you judge uh, the current set of problems uh, that the UK is experiencing, uh, to what extent these are a function of UK policy and to what extent they're a function of events in the rest of the world, and, and I think it's absolutely right there. Uh, uh, the, the rest of the world events are, are, are crucial here, and these are basically exogenous to the UK as they are to Scotland. You can do your best to insulate yourself against them, but I, th I agree there's, there's not a, a fantastic amount you can do. If you judge that, the, in addition to the world forces, that the UK government has behaved in a matter that has made things worse, then clearly there's a, a, possibly an argument for, for you, you might make an argument for greater Scottish uh, uh, fiscal powers and ultimately independence out of that. But I think it's rather difficult to do that, I, though I can see it, clearly the policies that the, the Chancellor pursued are controversial. Uh, and the UK, uh, the UK economy is in recovery, but it's a modest recovery, and some would argue that uh, the counterfactual is that the UK economy might have recovered rather more rapidly, had a different set of macroeconomic policies. So I think it depends critically on the point on that spectrum that, that you yourself judge is appropriate. So. Thank you. Um, 
on the question of, of Standard Life, which has had much publicity and other, other uh, corporated companies uh, threatening, in very honest, to uh, leave Scotland in the event of, of uh, independence, <coughs> it seems to me that in every incorporated company, the, the, the annual report has to highlight the risks. Um, so uh, the risk, for example, in Standard Life, it seems uh, very nominal in their an annual report compared to the kind of publicity that, that is generated about that. And I know that <clears throat> this came up a little bit before, but um, presumably the, there would be no rush from any company to leave until they, were, they better understood what was meant by independence. Which all of which would be down to the kind of negotiated settlement and the political philosophy of the nation and its, its relationship. Yes, I think that's, that's right. Um, I think what companies will do will depend really on what their clients want them to do. Uh, if Standard Life felt that, uh, since the majority of its clients <coughs> are not in Scotland, that it would, uh, it would, it would do better and get more clients, satisfy the ones it's got by moving part of its operation to England, then that is what it would do. Uh, it, that's the kind of thing that would determine it. Um, I'm less sure, really, whether there needs to be any action taken by the fund managers, uh, the people who run the investment trusts and things of that kind. But again, there might just be a feeling that, uh, uh, you know, in England, why should we put our money with uh, a company that's in a foreign country rather than our own. I mean, that's, that's the issue. Are you serious that everybody who has, uh, is a customer of Standard Life is really uh, thinking on, on the, in these terms? I think it could affect their ability to get new customers, possibly. I think people who they, when place an insurance policy with a company, they just want to consider what the risks are. And if they think there's a degree of risk because they're putting their insurance policy in, in a foreign country, in Germany or in France, then they won't do it. I mean, that's why most of these people uh, invest in their own country. And the question really is whether this would be a significant effect with independence. Depends very much on what happens, I think. Uh, and we can't really predict that in advance. I think maybe a, a one critical factor certainly would be uh, the judgment about the likelihood of maintenance of monetary union, because I think if, 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 if there was a lack of confidence around that, I think it would be more likely that uh, clearly the risk would increase and, and the incentive to move might be higher. I think this argument is very strange because people actually do not know the specifics of what they're talking about. Everyone in this room has a bank account. Uh, you have bank accounts with various different banks. Some of them are ultimately... UK banks, one of them is ultimately a Spanish bank, another one is ultimately an Australian bank. You go into any bank branch of these banks and ask the people on the, behind the desk the questions, uh, what is the regulated entity with which I am trading? Under what law am I making a contract between you and the bank uh, when I place a deposit? And what provisions could either the Scottish Government or the UK Government make to change the terms of my contract with you, and people would have not the slightest idea of how to answer these questions. Indeed, you could go to a top Scottish QC, and he would struggle to give you answers to these questions, and they would be very long. These are the questions which are actually relevant to what the risks you're taking, and how these risks would change uh, if... Um, if there were to be an independent Scottish government. It depends on what the regulated entity is, it depends on where the contract is made, and the answers to the, all these questions are rather obscure. Now, actually, if Scotland became independent, these things would be sorted out in ways that would be, uh, would be sensible for all parties. And everyone who thinks about it actually knows that that is the answer to that question. I think these fears are essentially imaginary. Uh, to investigate what they are is almost impractical. Uh, but that doesn't mean 
that people may not genuinely hold these vague, ill-formulated concerns. It's plain talking to people that they do. It's, it's just the issue that any kind of threatened change raises the, the unease and uncertainty that is created. I can't see that there's any material specific basis for it. And finally, just a very short question. The, uh, when, when we look at the, the economic scenario that, that's painted in, 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 in various reports and you, in your opinion, um, it's one side of a balance sheet or it's based on what is, what is the status quo across the UK. So um, percentages for defence and so on are roughly what's being done. But I mean, that's only one side of the balance sheet, really. You have to look at the other. So is it not the case that in an independent Scotland, um, with, with its, uh, its own set of priorities, that, that some of these balances would change quite dramatically? I mean, are you suggesting here that because of independence, economic growth would be at a different rate, a higher rate, or something of that kind? Uh. Well, I think it could be, but I, but I think that the, it, it's the expenditure, really, that we're... I mean, mostly we're talking about the, the, the collection of tax, the ability of the country to pay its tax, and so on. But the other side of that, apart from the kind of public services that everybody expects, whether it's the health service or education or, or so on, there are other expenditures that are made... In the, with the British government that, that Scotland might choose not to make. I mean, in, in defence, of course, is the obvious one, but there are other, many other uh, sections of a balance sheet of, of UK PLC that Scotland PLC might choose to change. Well, at the moment, of course, there are, there are some things on which there is... I mean, the, the Treasury produces its identifiable expenditure thing, and that leaves out of account things like foreign embassies and defence and interest on the national debt, since these are not, at the moment, capable of being allocated to particular parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, they're much the smaller part of the budget, actually, but um, it, it would be possible for Scotland to decide different things on these things, obviously on defence. On foreign embassies, I mean, the, I would expect the cost might, might go up rather than down, because Scotland would want foreign embassies all over the place. Not as many as the UK has, but maybe comparable with what Ireland has, something of that kind. Uh, and then the other area which is not really devolved at the moment very much is social security and welfare. I suggested in my paper that there, are, that there would be scope for devolving quite a lot of what the Department of Work and Pensions presently does. Not all of it with devolution, because I thought if we have devolution we would want to retain the same level of old age pension throughout the UK, uh, which is the main one. So, and that's nearly half, the, half of their expenditure. But there are a lot of other benefits which could perfectly well be devolved. If Scotland was independent, it might take a different view on all of these things, and its, uh, its rate of old, old age pension might be either higher or lower, and the way in which it deals with benefits might be quite different. I would expect that with time both the tax system and the expenditure side would both change dramatically. I mean, there is a, a need, I think, to reform the tax system. It's pretty anomalous at the moment. And Sir James Murleys, who's a Scot and a Nobel Prize winner in economics, has produced an enormous report making recommendations about the future of the tax system, which, incidentally, I haven't read because it's so long. But uh, clearly, an independent Scotland would want to look at this sort of thing. Uh, and, and try and come up with more uh, practical and uh, less anomalous uh, system. All that would take time, but it might result in quite a lot of differences in the long run. Um, I, I think, um, it, you know, one of the big arguments in favour of devolution or decentralisation, uh, fiscal decentralisation, fiscal devolution, is the idea that you bring decisions closer to the people who are affected by these, and there are undoubted benefits in, in doing that. Uh, traditionally, though, there's recognised to be areas in which perhaps the costs of doing so might be rather more significant, and, and I think we just had an example there. Defence and foreign affairs are the kind of areas that typically are emphasised in this connection, and so there may be some loss of efficiency as a consequence of that, but nonetheless, it undoubtedly would bring decisions closer to the people who are directly affected by them. Okay. Okay, um, Michael to be followed by Gavin.
Convener. Um, going back to some discussion we had earlier about the, you know, the capacity to, to grow the economy and, and how we would, would grow the economy, um, I don't think any of you suggested that you knew how it was going to uh, be possible to do that. But if we look to the Scottish Government white paper, which I'm reliably informed has the answer to everything, uh, they suggest that, um, that a 3% cut in corporation tax would grow the economy. Um, some people have analysed this, and Professor Stiglitz, I think, is amongst uh, a number of people who have suggested that that's not quite as straightforward a suggestion as it would appear in, in the white paper. I'm just wondering if uh, you had any comments, because we've, we've had uh, Professor Hughes Haller and uh, Crawford Beveridge in front of us suggesting that the margin of difference would have to be much more radical than 3% to have any any difference? Is, is that the, the, the type of analysis that you would uh, agree with? Well, I think it's, uh, it's, it's rather difficult to say. I mean, at the moment, as far as I can see, the two measures which are uh, which come out of the white paper on how you would grow the economy more are, first of all, a lower rate of corporation tax, and second, childcare to free up more of the labour market to take jobs. The latter one depends, of course, on the jobs actually being there. Uh, and getting more jobs will, would... I mean, if Scotland was able to generate more jobs, people would come in from outside, just as they did in the case of Ireland. So that would happen automatically. Now, Ireland... Um, I think Ireland has given people the idea that a lower rate of corporation tax would, would be the answer to all of this. I think there are various problems about this. When, when Ireland joined the European Union, it was the poorest member state by quite a long way. And nobody raised much objection to the fact that its rate of corporation tax was very low. At that time, as far as I recall, they didn't have any corporation tax on a business that dealt only in exports, only in the home territory. And they were obliged to change that, but they brought in a corporation tax of 12.5%, which was about half of what most other countries had in their corporation tax. Now, that did result in a lot of uh, companies looking at Ireland that wouldn't otherwise have done so. Incidentally, it's also resulted in a lot of people declaring their tax in Ireland without actually employing many people there, uh, just as we've had the same problem throughout the world with people like Google and Starbucks and the rest of them trying to declare their profits in the area where taxes are lowest. And that's affected the UK adversely and various other countries adversely. So if you, if you reduce the level of corporation tax, you would probably generate more economic activity. You'd also result in people wanting to declare their taxes in Scotland rather than in the rest of the UK. I think what that would mean is that the rest of the UK, if there was a negotiation for monetary union, would, <coughs> would insist that there wasn't a discriminatory tax which could attract business to Scotland, which might otherwise, for instance, have gone to the north of England. I think the north of England would really be up in arms if this happened. So I think it would be very difficult for an independent Scotland in monetary union, in currency union anyway, let's say, with the rest of the UK to, uh, to have a different rate of corporation tax. Now, I may be wrong about that, but I think uh, that's what I think about it. There's also the question of the European Union. I mean, the European Union have been trying, like anything, to get the Irish to raise their corporation tax. The Irish have so far managed to resist that. <coughs> but it's possible that as the Eurozone develops, that taxes will be much more harmonised within the countries that are in the Eurozone, and the Irish may have to give up their lower rate of corporation tax eventually. So it's a difficult issue, this, but uh, it seems to me fraught with all sorts of problems if Scotland wants to remain in monetary union with the rest of the UK or to join the European Union. I completely agree with Professor McCrone on that, that uh, the strategy of having a, a much lower rate of corporation tax, and we're not talking about 3%, we're talking about a much bigger difference, was successful for Ireland both in attracting economic activity and in attracting tax revenue in both of these things, almost entirely at the expense of other European countries. The very success of that <coughs> means that other countries are not going to be allowed to do it. And that's the, the practical reality, I think, of any negotiation we have. And we'd have to have extended negotiation with both the rest of the UK and uh, the EU over independence. So I think believing that that's where we're going to get economic growth from in Scotland is chimerical. Can I say that um, it's now 20 years since I left the Scottish office? More than 20 years, in fact. 
But while I was there, and I was there for 22 years, I spent most of my time trying to encourage economic growth in Scotland. That was my main objective. Uh, and I was uh, one of the architects, I suppose, of the regional policy that was introduced in the 1980s. And I regretted greatly the fact that uh, in the years of the Conservative government, many of the regional policy measures were removed, and it's been greatly weakened. We got the SDA set up, now Scottish Enterprise, and we, we managed to uh, preserve that during the 1980s, but only just. And I think that there's a problem now in the whole of the United Kingdom of in increasing imbalance between the southeast of England and the rest of the UK economy, and that is badly needing to be addressed with some sort of measures. Now, whether that means bringing back a stronger regional policy or what, I don't know, but these are the kind of measures which I think need to be pursued. And in the case of Scotland, uh, Scotland's actually done much better than other parts of the UK for a variety of reasons, partly North Sea Oil, partly the financial sector. And we have actually caught up the rest of the UK in terms of GDP per head, more or less. It's only about 2% below the, G the UK average. Whereas places like the north of England and Wales and other parts of England have done much less well. So the, the priority is not quite so great in Scotland as it is elsewhere. But I think we badly need to think of how the balance of the economy within these islands, whether or not Scotland is a part of the UK or becomes independent, we badly need to think how we deal with that. Because the southeast of England and London in particular will go on being a magnet unless something's done about it. Well, just to say that I, I agree with this point about regional policy and regional policy activism, but setting that aside, on, on the point about corporation tax, uh, together with colleagues in the Fraser Valdon Institute, we actually explored the impact of a 3% cut in corporation tax, uh, and uh, that basically uh, reaffirmed Professor Macron's intuition that this would stimulate economic activity in Scotland, uh, uh, ultimately. So we found that eventually this, this had a, a small stimulating effect on, on, on the Scottish economy. However, um, there were maybe two qualifications. Firstly, what we did was we explored this on the assumption of no, no reaction whatsoever on, on, on corporation tax rates set elsewhere in the UK. And in effect, it was around the time that there was negotiations with Northern Ireland about possibly an agreed, negotiated reduction in corporation tax. So we took that kind of scenario and looked at, at that kind of implication. So there was no, no uh, gaming around the setting of, of taxes, and that makes the analysis a great deal simpler in practice. Uh, that, that would be a major issue, as has already been said. And whilst in this particular case we did not seek to, uh, to analyse and didn't analyse explicitly the impacts on the rest of the UK, I think the point is correct again that there would be uh, almost certainly negative spillover effects to the rest of the UK, although, although we didn't seek to capture them. So, so under those r r circumstances, it, it, it looked as if corporation tax uh, cuts could could be effective in stimulating activity eventually, but uh, they were rather restricted circumstances. The other uh, aspect that uh, Professor McCrone mentioned was the, the childcare uh, initiative. Yes. Um, the, we've since discovered that the Scottish Government hasn't modelled the, any projections on that. The, the figures they've used are speculative at best. Have you done any gaming or modelling uh, of the, the figures that have been put forward in the white paper in that regard? Uh, no, we, we haven't yet. It's an area where um, we, we would uh, like to turn our attention, but we haven't been able to do so yet. Um, uh, these, you know, such supply-side policies are known to be able to generate significant effects, but, uh, but I think you, you, you need to be very careful about the specification of the transmission mechanisms and, and the link to the wider economy, and that's a challenge in itself, but, uh, but certainly something we would uh, be interested in looking at in more detail. Yeah. We haven't done anything yet. Uh, and just another question in terms of you know, how do we analyse these figures? Uh, a report yesterday in a, in a newspaper suggested that Commerce Bank, a German bank, had looked uh, at how the figures were being used uh, in, in terms of Scotland's economic performance. And one of the things that they identified that too often we're comparing apples and oranges. Uh, you know, the Scottish Government, for example, has used, uh, in terms of tax receipts, they've used it as a per capita figure, but in looking at public expenditure, they've, they've used the, the figures as a G, uh, a share of GDP. Um, but when you actually look at the figures in proper comparison as a, as a per capita, 
then the figures that are used in Scottish Government's analysis uh, would indicate that the, the spending uh, is 10% higher uh, in Scotland than the figures produced by the Scottish Government. Again, is that the type of uh, statistical manipulation that you're familiar with? Uh, not directly. I mean, I think that it's undoubtedly the case that spending, and undeniable that spending per capita in Scotland is higher, uh, significantly higher. But in, in general terms, I can't comment on that because I didn't read that particular piece of analysis, so I, 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 I don't have the data at my fingertips. All I would say is that this kind of, of debate, if it is that, and, and concern about the accuracy of data provided by the government is precisely why I think that there is a good case for establishing a fiscal commission and having that kind of independent analysis of these kind of statements, not just by that party, by any party, uh, by the government of the day, whoever they, they may be. And I, I think that's just indicative of the need for this kind of independent analysis. So, But I, I can't comment on the specifics of the case. But, um, I, I would agree with you entirely on that point. Thanks. It is the case, I mean, it's well known, that uh, Scottish public expenditure per head is higher than the UK average by about 10%. It's also known that onshore tax revenue, that's excluding North Sea oil, is about equal to the UK average, which creates a gap. The North Sea oil revenues uh, would be required to fill that gap at the moment. Uh, they, might, they wouldn't fill it completely, but they would go a long way to filling it. That's the essence of the budgetary problem. Somebody said earlier, you know, would it be more challenging as, if Scotland was independent? You would have to deal with this. If, if uh, Scotland's public expenditure was similar to the UK average, then the North CR would be a kind of bonus, and that would be all right. But it's higher than the UK average by about 10%. Now, nobody really knows whether that's justified. At the moment, it's been like that for <coughs> absolutely ages, and it was deliberately raised in the 1960s by the Macmillan government, uh, both in Scotland and the north of England, to try and deal with the higher levels of unemployment then prevailing. And we've tended to have a higher level of expenditure per head ever since then. But is it justified? There's no needs assessment that's been done other than a rather scrappy one by the Treasury in the 1970s. Uh, so you, you can't really decide whether it's justified or not until you do uh, that kind of analysis. Thanks very much. Okay, Gavin, to be followed by Joan. Thank you. Um, in our previous session this morning, which you may have caught the tail end of, the, there was a discussion about the Scottish rate of income tax and the transi transition costs for that are estimated to be about £35 million. Um, I just wonder if any of our panellists have looked at the transition costs for Scotland, were Scotland to vote yes uh, to independence in September. What sort of transition costs would we be talking about and has, are you aware of any analysis that has been done on that? Well, I've certainly not looked at this, but it's pretty obvious there would be quite substantial transition costs in setting up an entirely new tax system and in setting up a lot of institutions which, would, uh, which at the moment would be dealt with by uh, the UK level. And so there would certainly be transition costs, but I can't put a figure on it. I don't know if any of my colleagues can. I can't either. I think there are uh, a number of pieces of analysis that would be relevant to this. For example, attempts to measure the scale of the risk premium that would be associated with Scottish, Scottish government debt uh, and various other in individual specific pieces of analysis, but I'm not aware of an analysis that, that covers the whole thing, so I, I, I really don't have any idea what the figure would be. I, I would also say no. I, I do not think there is any work on this, certainly none of which I'm aware, and emphasise one point that I think has emerged implicitly at various times this morning, which is the number of kind of complicated details that have to be sorted out is actually extremely large and at the moment almost nobody knows how many of them there you know there actually are these are problems that only arise when you really get down to starting to think about it okay thank you um second question then uh, we, we've touched on the overall fiscal situation a couple of times during questions at one end of the scale you have the institute for fiscal studies who published uh, i think 50 year um projections at the other end of the scale, the white paper has projections for one year, uh, namely 2016-17. Um, do panellists have a view on what, what level of detail should be published um, for how many years so that people 
um, looking at this issue can, can get a, a reasonable sense. I know there are many unknown questions, but so that people looking at the issue sensibly can get a, a, an indication of what the fiscal situation might be um, for Scotland to be independent. What would, what would be a reasonable um, number of years and level of detail to be published either by governments or independently? One of the things you have to know about economic statistics is that forecasts are always wrong. Uh, they're a bit better than the weather forecast, but not much. Uh, and the further you go out, the more wrong they are, usually. Uh, I would like to see forecasts for five years ahead, but they have to be treated with a lot of caution, because all kinds of things can happen. I mean, nobody saw this, or at least very few people saw this financial crisis arising, which hit us in 2008, which knocked everything skew with. I mean, the, the government's forecasts, the UK government's forecasts of that time proved to be completely wrong. Uh, and it's nearly always the case that uh, economic forecasts, whatever they are, are not quite right. But you do these kind of exercises not because you believe the forecasts in them will come true, but to provide information that illuminates your policy decisions. So that, for example, the IFS work brings home that Scotland has two issues in relation to two particular issues in relation to declining North Sea oil revenues and a particular and a relatively unfavorable demographic situation. In looking at these for 50 years, one isn't saying this is what is going to happen for 50 years. It's simply an arithmetic way of identifying these issues in ways that should illuminate the debate and the policy decisions we make. I completely agree with that. Uh, I, I think in terms of forecasts, uh, I think we should think at least in terms of the lifetime of, of the, the government. And, 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 you know, I think a five-year period seems perfectly, perfectly reasonable. And I think people should understand, of course, forecasts are, are wrong because we cannot foresee the future, but that's not the point. They are conditional and understood to be conditional, but they inform us about a likely future, and they also provide us uh, with, with a modelling framework that would allow us to explore what the potential impact of policies were, and it seems to me that that should be an essential part of the policy formation process. In terms of longer term and, and the kind of projections that IFS uh, produce, um, they are understood in a rather different way and they're for a different purpose, uh, and, uh, and they are valuable provided they are, are interpreted uh, with caution. And so I think they are very useful in drawing our attention to potential problem areas, uh, but then that's a challenge for policy to respond to and see if there's uh, a way of, of resolving uh, any problematic issues. So I, I think the whole panoply of, of uh, shorter term forecasts and of longer term projections are a useful input into the information set that the public and the government can use in order to assess the quality of, of uh, the policy decisions that have been made. Um, just in passing, Professor Macron said that, that nobody saw the uh, the banking crisis and so on happen, but um, it, it, people that did, it, it's, yeah. a, it's amazing the number of people though today that write that said <laughs> they saw it coming. Uh, <laughs> they don't quite match up, but that's uh, merely a detail. Um, Professor, a question for Professor Macron though. You talked about in one answer that the rate of interest that you thought um, a Scottish government would have to pay in, in relation to borrowing. I wonder if you can just expand on what, what you think the, rate, the difference in the rate of interest might be between the Scottish government and what the UK government currently it pays. And then you also said, I think, something to do that this would uh, transfer in some way to mortgages in Scotland. I just wonder if you can expand on that point, how it would transfer and what, what that effect might be. Well, I think it's um, now fairly widely accepted that if Scotland becomes independent, that the rate of interest on its debt would be likely to be a bit higher than the rate of interest on UK debt because it's a new borrower doesn't have a track record of no defaults since the reign of Charles II, which is what the UK has. Um, and so for that reason, and also because it would be a fairly small borrower, the rate of interest would be likely to be a bit higher. Now, the National Institute have put a range of figures on this, and I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's something between 0.6% higher or 1.8% higher, something of that kind. I don't know. I mean, uh, I think you have to assume that it might be anything around 1% higher, probably, on, on, UK, on Scottish debt, uh, which has quite a big effect, actually, on the cost of the debt. Um, 
Now, why does that affect mortgages and things? Well, if, if, the, if the rate at which the government is borrowing is higher, that just tends to be reflected right through the financial system. And so you would probably get uh, higher uh, interest on mortgages as well. And, of course, there's a bit of a problem with mortgages because <coughs> it would be, if Scotland had a separate currency or was at all likely to have a separate currency, it would be rather foolish for people to have mortgages from a mortgage company in the rest of the UK rather than Scotland because they might find themselves, if the, if the Scottish currency depreciated, in a position where it was very difficult to afford to repay their mortgage, more difficult than it even is at the moment for many people. So that, that would be a potential problem. And it likewise can affect uh, pensions and all sorts of other things. So it just tends to feed through the market. We have to be careful about this question, I think, because we have to say, first of all, what is the currency in Scotland? And secondly, which is a different question, what is the currency in which people borrow? Because even if there were an independent Scottish currency, the Scottish government could and probably would borrow in pounds rather than its Scottish currency. And, equal, and it, that, that's also true for private firms in Scotland, and it's also indeed true for people who take out mortgages in Scotland. Uh, so there are two questions. What is the currency that is used in Scotland? Another question is, what is the currency that people in Scotland borrow in? Now, for people borrowing, borrowing in sterling, I can't see why it should make a difference to a Scottish company or a Scottish home buyer, uh, whether, they're located, well, whether they're Scottish or whether they're not Scottish. So the dis there's a discussion in the Weir Group report, for example, of why it would raise their borrowing costs. I can't see why it would, yet any, any more than uh, Novo's borrowing costs is raised, are raised on global capital markets by the fact that Novo is located in a small country of Denmark, etc., etc. Uh, and equally, if Scots chose to borrow in sterling, they would be able to borrow on similar terms, I would anticipate, to the terms on which a similar person would be able to borrow in England in sterling. If they chose to borrow in a Scots currency, if there was one, then the interest rate would clearly be determined by what the interest rates in the Scots currency were, which would in turn, in turn be determined by what the monetary policy of a a Scottish central bank turned out to be in that situation. But again, it's, we have to be careful about talking about what the actual legal position is and what the contractual position is, what the regulatory position is and what the nature of the contracts people make are. I think it depends a lot on whether there's any exchange risk in this. Uh, I can remember when I was in the Scottish office there was a company which more or less went bankrupt because it had borrowed in Deutschmarks and the pound had depreciated substantially over the period of its loan and it simply couldn't repay the loan at Deutschmarks. Um, so if there's a currency risk, uh, there is that danger. Uh, if there's no currency risk because the, there's a currency union and everybody's happy with it and there's no chance it's going to be disrupted, then of course there won't be much difference in, in the rates. But it's because there might be a different currency that I think people on the whole would be sensible if they had their mortgages from Scottish mortgage providers. I think just to agree with that, I think monetary union uh, makes things easier in that sense since it does eliminate, if provided people have confidence in the monetary union, that is, it eliminates the exchange rate pay, uh, risk part of the equation. Uh, however, if there was an independent uh, Scottish government within that union, then you would still expect, I think, a premium on, on the debt, and that would be, certainly be reflected on government debt, uh, but depending on where people were borrowing, it might not have an impact that's widespread throughout the Scottish economy. Yeah, I, think. I think the one near certainty in this is that a Scottish government would pay a bit more for borrowing in sterling uh, than the UK government does for borrowing in sterling. And that would happen because Scotland is a new borrower and Scottish debt would be illiquid relative to UK debt. Okay, Everything else is pretty much up for grabs. Thank you. Okay, for, uh, just la last question, if I may. Um, one or two other members talked about economic growth earlier as well. So if we could put 
corporation tax to one side and the uh, childcare idea to one side? Could you give an answer on those? Um, within the white paper, are there other ideas that you think would lead to significantly improved economic growth relative to the UK? I'm not aware of any, actually, but then maybe I've missed it. But I, I thought uh, the corporation tax and the childcare were really the two concrete proposals that were in it. Um, I would very much like to see faster aid be considered <coughs> in Scotland. Um, and we've been trying for ages to bring it about. Um, and this is why I regretted so much the, uh, the downgrading of regional policy in the 1980s. But where we go from here and how we increase the rate of economic growth, I think we're all still waiting to hear. You know, <laughs> I haven't got a solution to this problem. The largest issue is whether you would have a more vibrant entrepreneurial business community in an independent Scotland or not. And depending on the nature of the society that was established after independence, that could go in one direction or another. But that's the key issue we ought to be talking about in thinking about economic growth, indeed in thinking about the economic issues generally. The, the bit of the Scottish economy that has been disappointing over the years is the growth of the small business sector. We've done very well in attracting investment from abroad, particularly well during the, during the 1980s. Uh, and the Scottish Development Agency and following them, Scottish Enterprise, have done quite a lot to try and promote the small business sector. And that still remains the bit on which we need to do rather more. And I have a number of suggestions in my book about this. I mean, I think there is some advantage in trying to study what the Germans do with their middle stand, which is a very important part of their economy, and the fact that the banking sector operates in a much more supportive way of business than it does here. To my mind, too much of the bank lending goes into housing and not enough into other things in this country. I think, well, I would just echo many of these comments. I, I think uh, that the, the corporation tax and, and the uh, child uh, care would seem to be the two main uh, uh, ideas for economic growth, uh, which is not to say, however, that the Scottish Government doesn't have control of other levers that might have an impact on growth. I mean, it's a very difficult area, but, you know, they, 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 they have control over a large part of the spend, uh, and there may be opportunities there, and I know... Uh, some would claim they're already being taken, but there may be other opportunities there for directing expenditures in a way that might stimulate uh, economic growth, I mean, innovation and so on. And there would be, I mean, if, if, if there is independence, even uh, greater fiscal autonomy, there may be the opportunity to revisit the kind of policies that, that Gavin has raised, but uh, on a self-funding basis, and that might be worth exploring. I mean, one of the areas which needs to be looked at, I think, is, is, is training, vocational training. We have had a lot of emphasis on increasing the number of people that go through universities, but not the same emphasis, really, on trying to equip people to take with the vocational skills to go into business. And that, I think, has been a weak spot. Much better in Germany than here. Again, it's another aspect of the success of the German economy. And I think that, that needs to be looked at. I also think, actually, that uh, I would like to see the UK government look more critically at the whole business of takeovers. We are, I mean, there are occasions when a takeover is necessary and indeed helpful because a company is in difficulty and will collapse if it's not taken over. But there are many cases where companies are just taken over because of the aggrandizement of the management or because the shareholders get a short-term gain and so on. And in the UK, of course, the Cadbury case was a well-known example. And in Scotland, Scottish and Newcastle seem to me a similar case. I would like to see a bit more grit in the system so that these takeovers are not so easily uh, carried out unless it can be shown very clearly that it's really to the advantage of the company and the country in which it is. Um, I think that uh, the present hullabaloo about Pfizer and, uh, and AstraZeneca is another example of the same thing. Thank you. It's an example of how people have not got the significance of this issue and the drain of corporate headquarters out of Scotland as a result of acquisitions over the last 20, 30 years, is one of the serious issues, I think, raised in this whole debate. Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, I'm sure the witnesses are glad I'm the last uh, <laughs> committee member to be asking questions. Um, to go back, if I can, to the interest rates, I mean, I mean a couple of folks said that uh, when 
if and when Scotland becomes independent, there would be, because we don't have a history, uh, we'd be paying a little bit more of a premium to start with, at least. So presumably that's something that wouldn't last. Because, I mean, we have had some evidence that smaller countries uh, overall are actually paying lower interest rates, some smaller countries, than some bigger countries. So presumably we would have that potential, if not on day one, at least later on. Depends really how we run the country, to a large extent, I think. Uh, okay. You know, uh, if there's any kind of anxiety about the exchange rate, <coughs> then interest rates will be higher. Uh, I think, I mean, I haven't looked at this in detail, but I think it's usually the case that small countries pay rather more in interest than large companies. But, but John will perhaps know more about this than I do. Yes, um, small countries tend to pay higher interest rates in the same currency, as it were, in the global currency. So nobody pays better dollar interest rates uh, than the US government, though the German government pays, pay, pay, pays a similar one. Um, Denmark pays low interest rates, but that is because there's a one-sided exchange rate risk there, that the Danish krona might rise against the euro, but is very unlikely to, to fall. Hong Kong is in a similar position vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. Um, if uh, Scotland borrowed in sterling, which I think we should presume it primarily would, then I think we should and could expect it to pay a small premium to the rest of the UK government for that, and probably to do that on a, on a permanent basis, you just because... Or a, a carefully than, than the UK was? Yes, because the default risk in both cases is extremely small. It's really a, a, little, a familiarity and liquidity risk mm -hmm. uh, that is at issue. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Could no, I, no, yes, sir. Um, just, just to say that one of the difficulties here is actually that interest rates are, are the outcome of a number of complex influences, uh, one of which is country size. Um, but the one that was referred to earlier in the National Institute, conducted by my colleague Angus Armstrong and his colleagues, attempts to control for all other factors. So they, they you know, do, do models in which they attempt to control for everything else, including size of country. So, you know, debt to GDP ratios and other things that might influence perceived country risk. And the estimates they've come up with, therefore, are taking account of those other factors, at least in principle. So this 1% premium that's been referred to on a number of occasions, is that part of the interest rate uh, uh, level that they attribute to the small country effect? And so the 1% premium is, is the impact of the size of, of the country trying to control as best they can for all the other determinants of of interest rates, so just to clarify that. But I think it's important to say that because this is a small country effect, we should not assume that that would go through to private borrowers. Yeah, so that would affect the government more than it might affect individuals or companies? That, that's my view, yeah. Fair enough. I mean, I mean, that maybe links me on to my next point, because we've talked about, you know, the possibility of, uh, would the financial sector suffer and would some of the companies move south uh, if, if we were independent? But, it, it, I mean, it struck me that Switzerland as a small country uh, has got a lot, a lot of people of faith in Swiss banks, probably for historical reasons, probably more than their own country. So although it, it might be normal that an American trusts an American bank more than a Japanese or a Chinese one, uh, a lot of people throughout Europe certainly would trust a Swiss bank. So, I mean, is there a potential there for Scotland to actually do it the other way around and have a reputation for really good financial skills? Yes, you would have to build that reputation up. I, I, I mean, what, when I've asked this question, people say to me, well, this, the Swiss financial sector is not the same kind of financial sector as the one in Scotland, because the one in Scotland is a kind of offshoot of the London financial sector. Uh, and similarly, there's a huge financial sector in Luxembourg, and it's, it does perfectly well. It would, be, it would be perfectly possible for Scotland to have a very strong financial sector, but I suspect it would probably have to change quite a bit from what it is at the moment. I mean, where, where would we rank at the moment in people's view around the world, do you think? Very high, despite what we've done in terms of our banks. And in asset management, at the moment, we have precisely the kind of reputation you are describing. 
I think the concerns in relation to the financial sector are largely the kind of vague unease which I've described earlier. Mm -hmm. And that's real, even if there isn't any basis for it. And I don't think there is much basis for it. The other is that there is a fear, uh, I think also rather ill-founded, that Scotland might have um, uh, particularly inept regulation. Right, there's uh, no particular reason to think it would be more inept than any other regulation. Uh, but uh, at, at any rate, other regulation people are familiar with. They're not familiar with ours. I'm sure ours will be better. <laughs> um, the, uh, different subject, uh, the Barnet formula has been mentioned, and um, I think we've not spent a lot of time on it this morning. But, I mean, suggestions have been made, for example, that uh, four billion could be taken off the Scottish Block Grant, uh, if Barnet was re, uh, revised, um, I mean, would that have a big impact on Scotland and the Scottish economy? It would if that happened. I mean, I, the, no party has said it wants to revise the Barnet formula. <laughs> They've all shied off this. There's a lot of pressure in England and indeed Wales for it to be revised. Uh, the Holton Committee for Wales came to the conclusion that Scotland got too much and Wales got too little, which is perhaps not very surprising <laughs> since it was a Welsh Commission. But uh, the, the, the problem really is this, that um, if you're going to defend a level of public expenditure that's different from the rest of the United Kingdom and remain within the UK, then you have to have some justification for it. And at the moment, nobody knows uh, what a needs assessment would throw up. And the methodology of a needs assessment is actually quite difficult. There would have to be agreement between the Scottish Government and the UK Government on the methodology before you carried it out. The only needs assessment that's been done is the one that the Treasury did in the 1970s, which showed that, yes, Scotland deserved a higher level of public expenditure than the rest of the UK, partly because of the scattered nature of many of its communities and partly because of the deprivation in the west of Scotland. That was in the 70s. And the Scottish GDP per head at that time was much lower in relation to the UK than it is now. What Joel Barnett himself keeps saying is that, that the whole situation has completely changed because Scottish GDP is now more or less at the UK average, whereas it wasn't then. And uh, I actually wrote to Lord Barnett at one point saying that, but that wasn't the only consideration. It's, uh, it's things like deprivation and scattered population that are important. I was very struck when I was on the National Health Service Review thing that uh, the cost of providing comparable services in health in places like the Outer Isles and the Northern Isles and even the borders is much higher than it is, for instance, in Lothian. And, you know, all of that needs to be taken into account in any sort of proper needs assessment. But my guess is that if there were a needs assessment, it would still show that Scotland should have a higher level of public expenditure than the UK average for all these reasons. But it probably wouldn't justify it being as high as it now is. And certainly that was the conclusion of the Welsh study, that, that if you applied the sort of the sort of formula that was used for uh, determining public expenditure in the various parts of England, that Scotland would not be able to justify 10% higher, which is what it approximately is at the moment, but it would be able to justify something that was a bit higher. Yes. So we just don't know. Uh, and, you know, governments have shied off this, and that's all very well, but it does mean that the present, uh, you're trying to defend the present system is very difficult. And there'd obviously be political sides to that as well. Yeah. Um, Professor McGregor, you'd mentioned a kind of social wage and the whole concept of, um, you know, kind of sitting down in more of a partnership approach, I think, if I understood that correctly, so that you'd have the unions and yeah. government and presumably employers as yeah. well talking about together, you know, do we want a bit more uh, yeah. tax so that we get better education, etc. I mean, do other countries do that better than we do and do you think there's the potential for us to do that better than we do at the moment? I, I've got to be honest, I'm not an expert on wage bargaining systems in other countries, but my understanding is from people who know how these things work, that in, in the Nordic countries that's, that's a, a broadly much more an accepted uh, feature of wage bargaining, certainly traditionally so. That may be under tension 
now, in fact, and may, may be subject to change. So um, could it be done better here? I'm, I'm, I'm not actually advocating anything. What we were trying to do is just say what, what kinds of factors might influence the outcome here. I think if governments can successfully persuade unions and employers to think in those terms, uh, then there are potential benefits to be gained from that. And, and this, you know, this whole point of uh, the, 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 the ability to, to uh, which all of the uh, proposals, all the pro-union proposals even imply, is this ability to shift uh, both tax and expenditure levels in a significant way, either towards the Scandinavian countries or towards the Baltic countries. I mean, this, this is really not a narrow economic choice. It's a choice about the nature of the society that we wish to live in. And it seems appropriate in that context that, that you, you would think in terms of a, a more a collaborative view, perhaps, on, on in terms of determining wage bargaining. I, I'm not, I don't know how feasible that is, uh, but, but I think uh, would it... Could it potentially, if it were implemented, have beneficial effects? I think it could, and I think experience elsewhere suggests that it could. Whether it's feasible in this case, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's me. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, that's concluded questions from uh, members of the committee. I've got a couple of brief questions. Um, first one is just to Professor McCrone, really, and it's because he touched on welfare, and he said, I don't see why a large part of the responsibility for welfare should not be transferred to the Scottish Government and Parliament. Now, of course, uh, some may... Uh, provisions have been transferred. Council tax benefit was transferred, but only 90% of the revenue was transferred with the responsibility, costing uh, local government and the Scottish government £40 million. And we understand that bedroom tax may be getting devolved as well, which uh, the mitigation costs are £50 million. So I take it, if these are to be devolved, uh, you believe that the, the money should follow the policy? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that housing benefit should be devolved. I think that... Uh, carers' allowance, attendance allowance, I think even uh, disability living allowance, which is to be replaced with personal independence payment. I think that uh, the winter fuel allowance, I think the TV licences for people over 75, I think all of these things could perfectly well be devolved. And this is in the devolution context, not an in independence context. Of course, if it's independence, then the whole lot goes. But uh, if you did that, uh, you would find that you were devolving about a third of what the Department of Work and Pensions presently spends. And if you add that to what the local authorities and the Scottish Government are presently responsible for, it would amount to about half of the social welfare cost in Scotland. And I think that would... I don't see any reason for not doing that. That seems to me to be an important advantage, because one of the things that people constantly say is they would like more of welfare to be decided in Scotland. And there's no reason why the rates on these things I've mentioned shouldn't be different from what they are in the rest of the country. Yeah, as long as it's not an opportunity to cut our budget further by not actually funding them, though. No, sure. no. Well, exactly. I mean, the, the money's got to follow them. Uh, OK. And now, this last question, I'm going to try and end on an optimistic uh, note here. Now, we've, we've heard about all the, 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 all the kind of um, uncertainties and risks and that, etc., with independence. But I'm, I'm thinking... Um, and we also heard that, um, uh, you know, how would we grow the Scottish economy? Well, I'm going to th just throw this open to you. You're all at professors of economics, so I imagine you've all got, you're all bristling with ideas in terms of how to make Scotland a more dynamic, prosperous and thriving nation. So assuming it is a yes in six months, and of course, there's, you know, the, the, the opinion poll suggests it might not be, but assuming it is, what would each of you do to actually bring about that... Um, that state of affairs so that in 10 years from now Scotland is that dynamic, thriving, prosperous nation that we would all want to see. Don't, don't all rush. Can we charge for this advice? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mentioned two things. Yes. Uh, well, three things, actually. Um, I think that the, the training system needs to be beefed up uh, so that we have really first-class vocational training and decent apprenticeships. I think that... Uh, we need to look at, at takeovers and how they are decided and what the rules would be for examining takeovers. Um, Norman Tibbet, when he was Secretary of State for Trade and Industry, after the Royal Bank affair, when the Royal Bank was being bid for by Hong Kong and Shanghai and uh, Ch Standard Chartered, and I was very much involved in that at the time, but Norman Tebbit changed the law because he was so against what was ultimately decided, which was to keep the Royal Bank as a <coughs> separate entity. 
uh, and he took the regional consideration out of the then Monopolies Commission's remit in looking at the effect of, of mergers. I would like to see that go back in somewhere or other into the new legislation. And uh, I also would like to see us look at how on earth we can promote entrepreneurship and small business more effectively than we have done in the past. Professor McGregor? I, I would, uh, I mean, I guess I take, and I think this is where government's coming from as well, a, a fairly traditional kind of economist view of this, that, that really in the long run, uh, not that demand is not very important, but in the long run it's the supply side of the economy that we need to stimulate in order to stimulate growth. And, and that implies, you know, capital and investment. It implies the labour force, but not just the quantity of the labour force. That's important. And in Scotland, we can influence that potentially through migration flows. But we can certainly influence the quality of it. And, and, the, and the Scottish Government does routinely do so through, uh, I have to mention, higher education as a possibility here and, and the innovative activity. And actually, often higher education, you know, the, it's innovation and the creation of knowledge that's emphasised that. And that's very important. But what, what's really crucially important is the graduates that we produce and the skills that they possess. And, and a large percentage of the graduates produced in Scotland actually remain in Scotland and, and contribute to the quality of the, of the labour force. So education generally, training definitely, all of these augment the quality of the labour force. But again, there's this other factor uh, that is much more difficult to pin down, I think, and that's the entrepreneurial uh, spirit, if you want to call it that, and ways of, of seeking to, to stimulate that and Possibly some things could be done there, though I'm by no means an expert on it. And the Scottish Government itself has sought to identify growth sectors. I think a number of these have, would probably be agreed across the parties, and, and, and there may be policies there that could uh, help matters. I mean, I know renewable energy has been uh, uh, an area that has, until fairly recently, had fairly widespread agreement as being a potentially... Uh, a growth area here, and I think that remains so. So, so I think there are a, a number of areas that, that people could look at sectorally as well as the overall picture. I didn't drink biosciences as well, I understand. Uh, Professor Kay. I, I think a large proportion of these graduates do stay in Scotland, but equally a large proportion don't. And if we're emphasising business, and we should be emphasising business, it keeps striking me and... I had not known, actually, until the last few days that the chairman of Pfizer uh, was actually a Scot. Uh, and it keeps coming up that there are people who are, have important positions in large international companies who originated in Scotland and who have not been working in Scotland over in the last 20 years. Even to get quite a small proportion of these people back in Scotland would make quite a difference, part of creating this vibrant business community we're talking about. But for me, the largest part of it is to understand that now the big cap in providing finance is actually funding to fund the start-up losses of new small businesses. And that's where funding is needed and where, if anything, banks have withdrawn as they've withdrawn from everything and venture capitalists have withdrawn as they've found it easier to make money by funding buyouts of established businesses and uh, various kinds of financial engineering. Creating institutions there, which I think should have a mixture of angel-type funding, private money, with government funding, I suspect, being directed more towards helping on the procurement side than actually providing the finance. It's better if that's privately done, seems to me key. But these are the kind of issues on which I think we, all we, we should be concentrating. And it's that emphasis that Gavin McCrone and Peter have been talking about, of how do we create real effective small business and entrepreneurship in Scotland that is the big issue as to where we'll be in 10 years' time. When we set up the Scottish Development Agency, and I was involved in that at, at the time in the, in the 1970s, um, one of the aims was to get it to help to provide finance for business startups and so on. And it does do that to an extent. But what one found then was that whenever a company failed, they were hauled before the Public Accounts Committee of the House of Commons and given a hell of a grilling. You have to expect that some of them will fail. It's in the nature of the thing. And uh, we really need, I mean, I agree with, uh, with, with John that it's better if the private sector does it, but the public sector has to be ready to 
lend a hand, it seems to me, until the private sector gets adequately geared up and stops lending so much on people's mortgages and rather more on promoting small business. But that's why I think in the main the private sector should be providing the investment and the business and the public sector should help buy the product. And I have to say, in terms of the why so many Scots graduates leave, I work in the pharmaceutical industry, and because it's all headquartered in the home counties, if you want progression in your career, you really have to move there, whether it's in R&D, whether it's in management. And a lot of the management were Scots. I worked for companies all Scots because they were seen to be kind of social, sociable and assertive at the same time. Whereas in Ireland, because it was independent, they had the whole infrastructure, if you like. The same company in Ireland, but they had nothing in Scotland. Anyway, any further points anyone would like to make just before we wind up the session? Very the, the, the percentage of graduates who remain in Scotland is actually very high. It's of the order of 90%. I mean, it's really high. Of course, this export of human capital is very important. I don't deny it. And if we could retreat some of that, great. But, you know, we've got a very high percent. I think it's certainly the highest of regions in the UK. So, you know, it's, uh, it's beneficial. Well, thank you very much, actually, for your evidence today. That's uh, absolutely fascinating. And I'd like to thank uh, colleagues around the table for their, their wide array of questions as well. So that being uh, the end of that item, I now call the, the committee to a close exactly at 1pm. Thank you. <laughs>